Welcome to the Eastern School Committee meeting of Thursday, February 25th, 2021. This is a Zoom meeting during the um, emergency order from Governor Jolly Baker. To you, uh, in order to ask a question, you need to write it into the Q&A. Please remember to put your name and address. Um, also, we will not field any questions tonight that <clears throat> contain profanity or inappropriate language. If a question has been asked and answered, we will not address it again, um, just to kind of keep things more timely. This uh, meeting is being on, uh, broadcast on FaceTime Live, uh, Zoom, of course, and ECAT, which I believe you can watch during the week. So. Um, we're going to begin. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. All right. The first up is minutes executive session, August 20th, 2020. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or corrections? Seeing none, do I have a motion to accept but not release the executive session meeting minutes of Thursday, August 20th, 2020. O'Neill, so move. Star second. Thank you. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Asman, yes. Star, yes. Thank you. Next, executive session minutes from September 14th, 2020. Are there any comments? questions or corrections? Seeing none, do I have a motion to accept the executive session minutes of Monday, September 14th, 2020, but not to be released? Star, so moved. O'Neill, second. Thank you. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Grants, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. And one more, the executive session minutes of February 11th, 2021. Are there any comments, questions, or corrections? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, do I have a motion to accept the executive session meeting minutes but not be released for Thursday, February 11th, 2021? Wiseman, so moved. Durant, second. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. <coughs> Star, yes. All right, thank you, everybody. Everyone, okay. Next, we have personnel changes. Dr. Cabral. We have two announced retirements this evening. Um, neither one of these employees is able to join us this evening, unfortunately. Um, the first is the Easton Middle School science teacher, Kathleen Fowler. Kathy came to Easton in 2001 as grade seven science teacher at the Easton Junior High School. In 2008, that of course became Easton Middle School where she remains today still teaching science. She's been with the district for 20 years and plans to retire in July of 2021. Um, Ms. Fowler is a, a, a very valued colleague at the middle school. I'm sure Nancy DeLuca um, has worked with her and will have uh, a lot to say, but as anyone can imagine, in the last 20 years, not only has much changed in education, but certainly in science and um, definitely in the model of um, junior high school to middle school, which, um, you know, shouldn't be underestimated. It's a very interesting age group to work with. Um, my own mother was a middle school science teacher for many, many years. And so um, it goes without saying that we are losing another very experienced, um, very caring and dedicated educator in Ms. Fowler. Yeah, um, Kathleen uh, was on the blue team for a number of years, and now she's on the orange team, seventh grade science. And she's just low key. The kids love her. She's wonderful. And she has her little farm going down in Halifax. And 
she uh, has her, you know, her animals and things like that. And, but she is just like Dr. Cabral said, she's very caring, very intelligent and just has such a great way with the kids. You know, when you know, sometimes kids will say, oh, you know, this teacher, that teacher. But when they say, when they talk about Mrs. Fowler, they're very happy. So um, we wish her all the best, but we are sad to see her go. Absolutely. Anyone else? All right. I make a motion to accept with regret the retirement of Kathleen Fowler. Uh, do I have a second? I have no second. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Cabral? Thank you. Sandy Bourne came to Easton in February of 1995 as a clerical aide at the Parkview School. In August of 95, she was appointed to the position of secretary to the principal at Parkview, where she remains today. Sandy's been with the district for 26 years and plans to retire at the end of June. If anyone has ever been in a school, even as a student, you know that the secretary is the hub of the building. Everything literally goes through that person and goes out through that person. And um, Sandy has always been a welcoming presence in the elementary school through several different administrative changes at the building level um, and always with um, competence and um, a smile and makes the office a very welcoming place and keeps things under control. And um, again, very difficult to see someone like this leave, but we are very happy for her and um, for what the future will bring for her retirement. Well deserved. Does anyone have, go ahead, Jackie. So uh, my son was at Parkview and so I got to know Sandy. She definitely kept that office running. If I had any questions, if I needed any changes, I emailed her, she was always very responsive, very on top of everything. And just really a delight whenever I walked in the office. She was very welcoming. I just happy to see whoever walked in. She was, she's, she's great. We, we will definitely miss her. Caroline, uh, this is one of those occasions, and when I, in which I would like to ask if we really have to approve this retirement. Uh, <laughs> I can't even imagine walking into Parkview without Sandy being there. I mean, she's, um, I don't know, she just kind of represents that wonderful little community. So it really is a loss for us. Jen, you had your hand up? Yeah, so in, in my uh, entire career as a parent of a public school student, Sandy's the first person I spoke to. Um, I remember calling her when we moved to Easton. Um, my oldest kids were starting kindergarten in the fall, and she took the time to, you know, welcome me to Easton, gave me the lay of the land, explained everything. You know, back then we didn't have full day K, so it was, you know, options for half day K, you know, afternoons and things like that and before school and after school care and explain buses and all. And she was just phenomenal, just an incredible, incredible resource and so welcoming and um, just made a really great impression, a really good ambassador for schools and, you know, for families entering, you know, into kindergarten, the, the, those secretaries are their, their first point of contact and uh, she did a phenomenal job at that. So we'll, we'll miss her a lot. And I've known Sandy, you know, seems like forever. And her four kids are great. She has grandchildren. So I'm sure she's already got a, a full package for uh, when she retires and gets to spend some time on her own. But we will uh, miss her uh, greatly. All right, I'm going to make a motion to accept with regret the retirement of Sandra Bourne. Do I have a second? O'Neill, second. All those in favor? O'Neill, yes, also with regret. Durant, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. Okay, thank you, everybody, and congratulations, Kathleen and Sandy. All right, uh, discussion and possible vote to make a change to the 2021-2022 school calendar. Dr. Cabral. Thank you. This is gonna be a very short update because things are still very mercurial at even at the state level and we're not entirely sure uh, where we're headed in 
with um, any potential further federal stimulus funds. So I can tell you that the town administrator has, we, we've worked with him and he has released a, um, an initial memo and we have put in a 3% um, placeholder, if you will, um, not to exceed 3% for next year's budget. I will remind Dr. everyone. Dr. Gabral? Yes. We're doing um, calendar change. Oh, okay, thank you. You can do that next. <laughs> the I other will. <laughs> Let's do the calendar first. You this is also gonna me. be a quick one. You just scared me. <laughs> this is also gonna be a quick one. Um, the calendar um, that you approved, we did notice later that the first day of kindergarten, not for all students, the first day for kindergarten is on Rosh Hashanah. And so we're going to be making um, an adjustment to that. We are working with the principals right now to determine how we're going to do that. Um, and I'm, look, I'm looking at the calendar now. We have it set for September 7th. So we are looking to move it away from the 7th or 8th and um, potentially it will be on the 9th. What we have to determine, unless Assistant Superintendent Pruitt was able to talk to the principals further, what we have to determine is um, where their end date is going to be because they use the end of the school year for um, student assessments. Okay. We, we have not finalized that. Okay. so. We are going to be moving the seventh. We want to just make people aware of that, and um, we will get back to you once we determine. It's not as easy as moving it just a couple of days because it affects what happens at the end of the year. And we do kindergarten screening at the end of the year with staff. We don't have them after the school year ends, so we'll have to get back to you about what that is. But we wanted to keep you posted. Okay, thank you. Sure. Also, um, so we're not going to vote today then. No, we're not going to vote. The other, I did get a, a request from a faculty member um, to ask if Columbus Day could be renamed on our calendar to Indigenous Peoples Day. So I'm going to put that on next month's or next meeting's agenda okay. to see if we want. I guess a few towns have already done that. So um, just to keep in with the times, Jen. Um, there was also, I had received a question from a parent on whether or not we were still planning or, or would have a placeholder in May for the early release day that typically happens around when senior prom typically happens. And I, I, I actually forget if it's a, a full day off or an early release day, but I, I think it's, that's been it's typically been in the calendar when we've approved it in the past. So we, um, we, don't, we don't actually plan it around the prom. We actually have them plan the prom around that date because that date is actually um, set for placement for elementary students. It's when the teachers have their placement meetings and so the students are dismissed so that the staff can all work in the afternoon to determine, they literally place each student by hand, um, determining determined by, um, the level of need, IEP, support services in that classroom, and so forth. So we do request that they, just to clarify, we don't have it a half day because of prom, but we just, we do have them typically work around that. So we will check with the high school. Okay. I don't know what their prom date is for next year, but we'll check into it for you. The other thing too, um, I know, I know it hasn't happened because of COVID now, but that half, there's a half day at some point and that science team, the science group does something at the Richardson Olmstead? That's in March and that's already in there. That's, um, what day is that? Do you know, March? Yeah, 24th and 25th are both oh, half days. All right, so that it's gonna be in there. Okay, great, great. Okay. All right, any other questions on the calendar before we move on? Okay, Dr. Cabral. Budget update, you may begin. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, again, this is gonna be quick, um, but we did put in a 3% placeholder with the town. With that 3%, there still remains a $1 million 
deficit, uh, just about a million dollar deficit with the town. Uh, most people who follow this kind of thing will know that that is typically how we begin because as time goes on, we get more and more refined information. The information is very, very broad right now on what is going to be available and we're still um, doing estimates on increases for next year. I do want to point out that without fail every single staff member in the Easton Public Schools, every bargaining unit contract and every individual contract um, all has already agreed to a 1% increase next year. Um, and that was extremely helpful to us because we are able to prolong or, or um, push out contract negotiations for a year. It's very difficult to determine what three years is going to look like right now, especially with um, an eye on the hopefully rebounding um, um, budget in the state and also the nation. So we are um, looking right now with the 3% at a budget of 43,912,000 970. And I just want to clarify, um, sometimes people say, well, if there's a 1% rollover in salary, why doesn't that just come out to 1%? But it's very important for people to remember that depending on which um, profession we're talking about, there are industry standards for steps and lanes and longevity and benefits and things like that in people's contracts, and that all gets worked into it. And so it's uh, just about 2% actually when you um, when the calculations are completed. The other 1% we are reserving for things like our service contract um, extensions. There's uh, not only an increase in um, needs for personnel, but also for services in terms of energy, in terms of uh, for facilities, in terms of our legal and transportation contracts. And all of those estimates um, are really just that at this point. And so we're waiting for those numbers to come in. That's, that's the kind of thing that helps us refine those costs that we're talking about. In addition, we want to be sure that we leverage every dollar of any federal stimulus, stimulus funds we may get, and we do not yet have that information. We're not even positive if, if the last stimulus is going to come through. So um, that, that's why it leaves a lot in the air but we are working very hard to stay to the 3%, which um, in effect would be um, a level service budget for next year. Any questions? Okay, and we begin the budget. All right, thank you, Dr. Cabral. Okay, uh, next is district updates. Okay, thank you. So district update to this point has in effect been synonymous with COVID update. So um, the same is true today as well. I'm gonna ask uh, Su Assistant Superintendent Pruitt if she can share a presentation with you. I'm sure there are a lot of questions about the recent information from the commissioner and um, the governor, and we are going to uh, try to encapsulate all that for you. Okay, and you see this okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So just to give an idea of what this presentation is going to be about, um, I just want to remind everyone that the plan that we have had in place since September, um, we did it very differently than most other districts in the Commonwealth. We have a very cooperative and collaborative relationship here with our staff and a great respect for their uh, education experience and knowledge. And they are extremely dedicated as well. If you remember from prior conversations, we had over 160 of these professionals dedicate their summer and additional extra time to helping us not only develop the plan throughout the summer, but to continually 
um, have an eye on it, tweak it, and work toward potential solutions for some of the challenges we've been facing. That is very different. Uh, many other districts, the superintendent either came up with a plan or a leadership team or small cell of people. The reason I bring that up is, is well, there are several me reasons, but um, first among them is the fact that several people have asked me, why have we not made so many changes to our plan? Why is it very similar to how we started? And the reason is because we did not push something out to people and then have all the feedback of all the very many ways it's not working from different lenses and viewpoints. We were able to hammer out a lot of those potential problems all summer long and to improve upon what we theorized would be the very, very best model under the circumstances for the children of Easton. We took into account the specific needs of Easton, our resources, and what our staff was willing to do to keep these kids on track. Probably the biggest uh, benefit to that was the live remote learning. And again, I'm going to ask that as we go through this conversation, people remember that a lot of times they are bringing what other districts are doing to us. They're bringing what the federal government is requiring of schools or the state government is requiring of schools. And I just want to remind people that we cannot compare one school to another and not just because resources are different. Um, because there are just different ways of doing things and among them is the staff that you're working with. We have had continual staff cooperation. We have worked collaboratively with all of our unions. We never had to ask staff to do live remote learning. In fact, that was brought to our attention in the summer and then we vetted that that has been something that has provided the most amount of structured learning time for our students. And when other districts really had to scramble, when the structured learning time mandates came out from DESE, and then again, when refined mandates came out from DESE, our plan stayed true um, and passed all of the requirements that were asked both times. So many districts made changes because they had to, because they weren't offering what the state was considering the minimum. And I'm just gonna remind people of what that is as we go through the presentation um, to show exactly where we're at with our time on learning. We are in fact serving as a model. I've said this several times, we probably won't share a list of the districts because it's professional courtesy. We've met with many, um, superintendents, we've been contacted, we've met with full um, staff contingencies, and our staff has actually volunteered their time to work with other staff in other districts as well, because people who understand what quality structured learning time is, i.e. our colleagues across the Commonwealth, understand that the model we have really does provide the best under the circumstances for our kids. And like I've said before, it is great for our kids in this climate. It is not great for our staff. It is very difficult in other districts. One huge difference that keeps districts from doing it the way we're doing it is that they have a staff that won't even consider it. Because teaching students in your room, particularly littles, with live students online is a tremendous responsibility it's double the planning and it just has many implications for an extremely trying and difficult experience for educators, but our staff has been doing it for the benefit of our kids. Again, uh, just a reminder that the guidance is for the entire state. Um, even the most recent guidance that the commissioner is um, saying that he is compelled to get kids back in school and we agree. We have to remember though that 100% remote learning still continues for 400,000 students in this state. These are the districts that the state is most concerned about. 
there are significant deficits that exist. These are the districts that the state is most concerned about. And as much as the governor and the commissioner are concerned with the state because that is their responsibility, we are concerned with Easton specifically, and that is our responsibility. So everything we've done to this point has been very specific to Easton. Um, I also want to quant qualify that I'm going to be sharing facts this evening, not excuses. Um, an excuse is when we say we're not going to do something because we can't because of these factors. We have said all along that these are our current realities, these are our current challenges, and we're still working on them. It's what we do every single day. We have a meeting tomorrow, actually, that was planned a while, several weeks ago, um, with principals where they have been collecting information from their staffs to share with us about ideas for moving forward. We went into this process collaboratively with our staff they came up with a plan that is, is worthy of the students of Easton, and we are going to continue to solicit their input collaboratively as we go forward. Um, and so the principals have been collecting that at, at certain levels. We are sharing that tomorrow. That was planned far before the, any announcement from the commissioner or the governor. And so we are going to continue sharing those current realities, and I'm gonna review them tonight. And then what are the understandings going forward? In other words, if we were to move to five full days in person for K through five, for example, what does that mean for the students of Easton right now? Without further um, time to vet out solutions, what does that look like for us right now? Now, I'll just preface that by saying the reason we haven't moved to those right now is because we feel as though it would be sending our students backwards. And while we are looking constantly to make a change to bring students back, it's always been under the understanding and the commitment of all of us that we would do it in a way that didn't set students backwards. Um, and so um, I will explain those understandings. And obviously if we come up against a deadline whether that is state imposed or otherwise, um, I will be repeating what I, again, have been saying are our current impediments and where that, what that means for students and families. Um, I don't think anything in this presentation is going to be new information. It's more of a compilation of the information that we've been sharing repeatedly, whether through newsletters, emails, or prior school committee meetings, but we're putting it all in one place so that people can have um, a visual area with data to refer to when they see changes uh, going forward for the school district. I'm gonna start with our time on learning. And DESE regulations, as you can see, require, um, I'll explain what each of these categories are, because we have several K through eight schools in the state, not in Easton, but in the state, even though Easton considers pre-K through five to be elementary and six through 12 to be secondary, again, state metrics need to be representative of the state and not specifically to Easton. So K to eight is considered elementary for their purposes and nine to 12 is considered secondary. Time on learning is done in two week increments. And the reason for that is because some of you are aware that in different districts, there are some models where the students participate in hybrid for a week, and then they participate in remote for a week. And so capturing a typical week for those schools would have not been possible at the state level. And so they chose to do it in two week increments. That's the reason for that. It's, um, Irrelevant for Easton, but just so people understand why that happened, 
that's the reason. So time on learning in two weeks, students in, at the elementary level are expected to have 50 hours of instruction and secondary to have 55 hours of instruction. The next category is live or synchronous instructional hours. That means any hours that a student either is on the computer meeting with a teacher or meeting with classmates or in the classroom meeting with the teacher or classmates. You can see that's static at 35 hour expectation every two weeks for elementary and secondary. And then fully remote live and synchronous is if a child is fully remote, but it's work that they're doing during the school day. They may be working on their own, but it is still during the school day. And that is um, if a child is um, only remote and not hybrid, they are required to have 40 hours every two weeks of instruction. So again, a reminder, where are we in Easton? Well, you'll see elementary is required to have 50 hours every two weeks. In our elementary, grades one, four, and seven are all above that. Um, the reason we're using grades one, four, seven, and 10 is because that's what DESE uses as their dipsticks. The last two charts were actually lifted right from the DESE report. And so we're just reporting it out as DESE collects it and as DESE reports it. The next two columns show whether a student's hybrid or whether they're fully remote in grades one, four, and seven, it doesn't matter. We surpass the minimum number of hours um, very easily. You may remember from recent news reports there were many districts in the state that really had to scramble because when they calculated their hours, uh, they were in the 20s, for example, and it created uh, a great shift in their scheduling. Uh, we did not have to do that because not only did we meet the minimum, but um, as I said, we surpassed it. The next is secondary. The requirement is 55 hours, and as you can see, we exceed that. And then for hybrid and fully remote, it is 35 and 40 hours, and we definitely exceed that. Now, when it says grade 10, just keep in mind it's just a dipstick for the, for the state. So 10 represents grades 9 through 10, 7 represents grades 6 through 8, maybe not everywhere, but in Easton. Um, and then grade 4 would be the entire Richardson Homestead School all grades have the same number of hours and grade one for us, again, would be the same for K1 and two. Any questions about time on learning? Okay. And again, that's with our original plan um, from the summer, from, from people who have never done this before. So I, I need to make sure that the community recognizes the really dedicated staff that worked on this and really, um, put in their entire, um, not just their energy, but their um, professional capacity and years and years of experience of knowing what would work for children. And the state validated that very clearly with um, their minimum requirements. So now I'm just gonna take a look for a second. Um, you know, this is about COVID after all. So we're gonna talk about where we've been. Um, again, I'm just showing fact factual information because I do receive a lot of letters and correspondence that um, I'm not sure of the sources, but the information in it is, is flawed and usually is incorrect. So I just wanna share the information of the metrics that we use. The CDC indicators, these are the recently released, February 11th, these are the updated CDC indicators. Um, Easton is, uh, unique in the sense that uh, we have we are a college town and we have um, Stonehill in in our town, um, very similar to Norton with Wheaton. We happen to be the two largest testers, other than the large urban centers, and that is because the colleges and universities are able, or particularly the private ones, are able to test all of their students. Having an um, offering a percentage of number of cases for tests done would not be accurate for those two towns, for example, because 
The Stonehill students receive so many tests on such a regular basis, their numbers are going to dilute what is in the town. However, a more accurate indicator is the incidence or the transmission, which is the total cases per 100,000 people in the past seven days. In that way, you can compare communities, cities, and towns because it doesn't matter if every town in, in, or in every city in the state has 20 cases, some towns have 25,000 people in them and some cities have 100,000 people in them. So you're not comparing apples to apples there. Obviously, 20 in a, in a small town is uh, a lot more um, per 100,000 persons than in a, a large city. But this is what CDC has come up with as what they considered low, moderate, substantial, and high transmission. Uh, many will recognize that the state also has colors and they're different. However, it is just the colors that are different. In other words, they, the state also has four indicators. The lowest is uh, gray. Moderate here is yellow, but it's blue at the state level. Substantial is orange here, but it's yellow at the state level. And red here is, um, is red at the state level. So sometimes people will say, you know, we're in, we're in the yellow. And if you're talking about CDC indicator, that's incorrect, as opposed to maybe a state indicator. But it's important to remember that substantial transmission on this chart is second from the top in terms of substance and concern. And in the state, yellow is second from the top. So it's, um, it is erroneous to consider the colors alone as yellow always means medium and orange is always worse. <laughs> They're actually comparable between CDC and the state, if that makes sense. Reason I'm picking on orange is because you will see that the rates in Easton since early December have largely been orange. Um, February 25th is the date of this next um, reporting period. However, that has not come out yet. It usually comes out after 5 p.m and it wasn't ready right before this meeting. So I will add it, of course, as soon as we get it. This rate in Easton is now included on our weekly um, dashboard on the district website. It's important to remember though that the dashboard we keep is weekly, the dashboard the DESE keeps is weekly, and the rate in Easton is every two weeks. That's important to continue. That's, how they do it at, the, at that level. So it's just important um, to remember that when you're taking a look at that data, but it's represented with the accurate dates on that chart. I will just remind people that February 18th, when this was reported, um, you know, this period was until the 13th. This is very typical for, and I didn't make this a slide, perhaps I should have, but if one were to look at our dashboard at, on the district level, you could quickly uh, validate what I'm saying. We have within the school system seen significant spikes in our cases from four to eight a week to 20 to 30 a week immediately following vacation periods. Um, and for the last two vacations, it has been a consistent four week spike and then a two week decrease. And then it was the next vacation where we had a four week spike and a two week decrease. And then it was February vacation. So we now, I would expect this February 25th date since it's reflective up to the 20th, which was the end of February vacation, where a great number of our families were not even in the town of Easton. I would suspect this number perhaps is yellow. Um, I want to point out, however, that the base number for the orange determination is 50. So we are at 46.6, um, essentially 47, and orange is 50, so it's not exactly far. Um, however, based on, on the data that we have from school since the beginning, it would indicate 
that the week, the two weeks after this week here would likely be in the orange again. So what exactly does orange mean? That's the next slide. Desi continues by explaining what they recommend for orange. And you can see, next slide please. Elementary schools are to be in hybrid mode with physical distancing of six feet or more required, not recommended. And next, middle and high schools also in hybrid mode or reduced attendance, physical distancing of six feet or more is required. Now that's national level. Next, we'll take a look at the state level. And the next, this, this slide shows at the top that this is reflective up to February 24th. And you'll see on the next slide that zero to 19 year olds still, because this has been going on for some time, still represent the highest number of positive cases that are identified uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Now, we've talked national and state, and let's see Easton particularly. This website, this is all available through the uh, CDC and Mass DPH websites. It's updated regularly. Anybody can make use of it. I actually put the website at the bottom, but I believe it got cut off. But um, COVID-19 interactive data dashboard, and it will bring it up for you. On the next slide, you'll see that Easton um, had, this is the 46.6 that made us quote unquote orange. Um, you can't scroll down on this because it's a snapshot, but you can see at least on this, and I'm telling you on the rest of them, and certainly anyone can look it up online and see for themselves, that the most recent data shows that only a Cushnet and New Bedford have a higher um, daily incidence rate than Easton right now. Um, Fall River and Taunton both have a lower incident rate than Easton right now. So that is our current reality. And the next slide shows from the Board of Health that they have consistently, the first, I, I separated them because I reported to you in December the figures in the first column, which showed that 18 and under um, children represented the second highest category of incidents in Easton, 20% of all cases in the town. And that has held true until today. Total of 220 cases, or again, 20% um, in Easton. Only 19 through 29 year olds, uh, which of course include college students, um, have more cases only by four. Um, and this actually, I believe, is extremely, is, is, is a deceivingly low number of reported cases. And the reason for that is because we have kept, um, logs with the with uh, daily updated sheets with every school uh, nurse's office and we keep track of any cases any developing cases any suspected cases of covid and what we've seen since december actually is an increase in notes by the nurses of parents who are electing not to test so what i mean by that is if a student is exhibiting symptoms, the nurse will log it and then they'll keep it up to date by noting this child has an appointment with their primary care physician or this child is getting tested or these siblings are going to this site to be tested. And then the nurse will further update it with any positive or negative tests or we will based on what the Department of, of the Board of Health reports to us. Increasingly, we have seen notes that say parent has chosen not to test will keep student home for two weeks. Um, obviously to us based on the data we have so far there are 
an unknown number of cases would, which would then have been positive from that. But because they are quarantining their child and keeping them isolated, um, we will never know whether they were positive or not. There certainly was a reason for doing that, whether the person, whether the parent felt that the child was a close contact to someone with COVID or whether they were exhibiting symptoms. And so um, there's certainly reason to believe that some, in fact, many of those students could potentially be positive, uh, but we will never know that. So we did find that most parents were having their students tested in the beginning and now they're keeping them home. We are thankful about that, that it, we've had great cooperation from our parents and feel that it is a, in large part why we've been able to keep kids safe because when a parent has a suspected case of COVID, they have kept the children home. And one of the reasons we believe that is true, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is because of our live online teaching that is available to them. We believe that because a, a parent knows that their child can remote into the classroom and be an active participant in that classroom for the full two weeks that they're out and they're not going to miss school, that they're keeping those children home. And we are happy that that is um, an opportunity because um, in all likelihood, that is keeping our greater school population safer. Uh, but the fact remains that 20% of the cases in Easton are of our youngest citizens, 18 and under. Now, with all that said, I think people are probably aware, I certainly won't go through all of this, but the next three slides show that between March 1st and March 22nd, the governor announced at one o'clock this afternoon that he is relaxing capacity restrictions in Massachusetts. So you have the current reality of where we are in terms of cases and infection rates in the states and also in Easton and then in our schools. Um, now, effective March 1st, which is Monday, um, perform, indoor performance venues will open at 50% capacity and recreational activities, things that are clearly targeted toward children like laser tag, roller skating, trampolines, etc. We also have on March 1st, um, arcades, um, fitness clubs, health clubs, um, these are all free from capacity um, or have had more stringent capacity restrictions and they will increase to 50% capacity. Again, places that um, attract children and families. Um, in, in the next slide, of course, these are all available online as well from the governor's office. Um, restaurants will no longer have any seating capacity, but they are required to be seated six feet apart. Uh, gathering limits have also changed not only in event venues in public settings, but also in private settings. And finally, effective March uh, 22nd, um, the Commonwealth will then move to stage four, which then opens many other things, including overnight camps for um, children in the summer. So with all of that in, in mind, um, we make decisions for capacity in our buildings. And those are just some of the metrics that we've been using to make those decisions. I understand, however, that there have been several concerns with, um, well, one is enrollment, which I didn't put on here, um, but I can address that, as well as academic progress, special education, referrals, new referrals, and the mental health of our students. Now, I want to preface this very strongly by saying we are well aware that some students are not making as much academic progress as they would. Some students will be identified with special needs and some students will face some mental health challenges. Um, we are in a global pandemic. This is not business as usual. 
regardless of how many days students are in school. But again, it is extremely important to us that we share our current reality. So I realize that um, several people have said that we have lost a tremendous amount of students we actually had 3,455 students last year. This year we have 3,477. And that includes um, a much lower number of pre-K students, which is what we're seeing across the state and makes perfect sense. People are keeping their children in daycares as opposed to sending them to public schools. They're typically smaller. They're typically ones that they're more familiar with. Um, and despite that, we are right now, we have 22 students than, more than we did last year. Um, so have we lost some students? Uh, yes. Is it um, in some way impeding our progress as a school district? Um, no, it is not. And we don't think that all of it is permanent either. In terms of academic progress, I will just let Christy go over a couple of slides with you. This is not a presentation on academic progress. We certainly can further um, present that at another school committee meeting if you would like more information, but I asked her to just give a representative sampling of some of the um, standardized tests we use as benchmarks for our students every year, but where are they in comparison this year? Thank you, Dr. Cabral. So we are, we currently use in grades three through eight, what's called the STAR assessment. Um, we use CBMs in K through two. Because we don't have the longitude, long, longitude, <laughs> I don't know why, that's a tongue twister for me. Um, we don't year have, to year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we don't have the year to year data um, for, for grade one, the grade one cohort right now, we don't have that data up here for you to see. This is representative of how our students um, in grade four, so our current students in grade four and our current students in grade seven, how they have progressed over the past few years. And this again, is just a sampling. So in, in the, the snapshot of an assessment that we provide, that we, that we give them. So you can see, it's not a huge difference. You, you might be concerned about, you know, the blue being larger here, um, where it was less there. But when you look at the actual numbers, you see that we're, you know, we're, we're about four off. Um, four and students, again, four children. Four, so, thank you, four children. And, but then again, also, when you look at the number, we have, we have an increase of 14 children in grade in this particular cohort. So again, we, we, this isn't individualized by any means. It's just an overlook at, at how the, the grade level itself is doing. Um, and then when you look down at seventh grade again, you'll see that while there is a change, it's not it's it the it's not striking of the difference between between the data um, that we're seeing. Of course, I'm I'm a data person, so I would dive right into you know finding out who those particular students are and working with the principals and the teachers on on. Um, what exactly their interventions are to, to make sure that they're that they're moving up back to where they should be, and that is currently happening. We are our students are in intervention; they are utilizing this data. Um, our interventionists, while they are providing as facilitators, they are also providing intervention for students that need it, and these interventions are occurring. And um, it's also important to note that typically, when we look at longitudinal data, we do see. Um, changes, for example, in the number of students that are at or above level or below level because they're moving up a grade. Correct. They're changing a grade. They're doing significantly different material. Um, data meetings happen from K through eight in reading and math, and none of the children that are represented, even though we're saying, well, it's four children. To us, that's still four children. Exactly. And every single one of those gets an individual look from the team who works together to say, okay, this is where the student is, have they made gains? Because a student could potentially move uh, categories, but that student actually made gains when you look at their scores. Or a student can remain in the yellow category or needs improvement category, but they went from the bottom of the needs improvement category to the top of the needs improvement category. And that is what we look at, is the growth of each individual child. 
So the next shows the math data um, in grades four and grade seven. Again, we were strictly looking at one, four, and seven because that's the that's comparable to the grades that that Desi is using for reporting out measures currently. I will also point out that, like I said before, grade two does not use the star assessment, so that's why there's no activity data found um, in in that um, that particular uh, um, row. Again. Of course, there's areas that, that we're looking into and diving deeper, but one thing that you can see is that the, there, there is concern because it is, you know, an increase in students here, for example, 15 students here, but it isn't necessarily out of the ordinary that we're finding this, um, it isn't as drastic as, as what we had originally thought was going to happen. So, you know, we as we are looking at the budget for next year and we're constructing, you know, what what we are doing for for ways to um, uh, lessen the gaps that, that we may see, we're we're happy to see that it isn't it isn't the quantity of students that we had originally anticipated. Um, again, please understand that every single student that is not meeting benchmarks we are paying extreme attention to and are providing as much intervention as, as we can in this model currently which we um, do every year but absolutely. another and another thing to notice is um you know there may be i'm using my cursor like you can see it there might be um, an increase of five children in the red category so to speak for um from grades three to four, but there were 14 more students um, who joined that cohort. So right. one of the very first thing that staff does is look, put a name to every one of these children and see where were those 14? Did those 14 represent the, the far below average? Where did they come from? What, did they, what do we need to do to help close their achievement gaps? Maybe they haven't been in Easton for first, second, third grade. So those are the things that they'll be looking at. Right. There's a there's a lot more work that goes into what we're sharing with you tonight, yeah. as far as when the dating data meetings occur, and the teachers and the teams really, uh, the interventionists, the principals, they really dive deeper into the data to get more uh, more of a picture of what's actually going on. Also, something that we found is that this assessment is provided online, and sometimes we even may see that a child just quickly rushed through the assessment. And we do have the actual calculation for how long a child spent on the assessment so that if that is the case, we can ask them to retake the assessment. Um, so again, th this is just a snapshot of, of two grade levels um, currently in Easton. And again, um, you know, we're, we, we know that we have a lot of work to do and a lot of and students that we need to address and provide more instruction towards. However, we were happy to see that it isn't the quantity that, that we had originally anticipated. And that's reflected also in our special education referrals. So a referral is if a parent or a um, staff member has um, referred a child for screening for a special education um, identification. You can see that last year from 19 to 20, we had an initial meeting, which means the investigatory meeting for 83 students. 26 were found not eligible. There are very strict um, measures that we use in Massachusetts to determine eligibility and 57 were found eligible. Um, on the contrary, we've had 57 initial meetings this year in the same time period 14 were found not eligible and 43 were found eligible. So uh, again, one of our concerns was that special education referrals and um, potentially special education determinations would skyrocket and it has not. Um, and this is the data that um, shows you that. In terms of our mental health, we again have been extremely concerned about the mental health of our students. You're hearing about crises across the country and indeed across the world and certainly in Massachusetts. But once again, I want to point out what our current reality is in Easton. These are only some of the measures that we use to check where our students are at. And you can see that in terms of mental health hospitalizations, um, in the same time periods last year and this year, 
we had last year 34 students, uh, excuse me, 26 students that represented 34 hospitalizations because of course some students may require more than one hospitalization in a time period. This year we've had a total of 13 students, literally half of last year um, for a total of 16 hospitalizations. That is a significant decrease for us. Um, and in terms of outplacements, specifically for emotional needs, I disaggregated only emotional needs for this since mental health was the concern. They were down overall um, by dozens, but just the emotional outplacements last year, we had 17 and this year we have 12. And so the suggestion that our data uh, is going to be significantly skewed by mental health needs has not born true in our data. Um, now, these are just numbers, but these are all individual students for us. So in order to not be found for um, special education determination, they were very carefully, um, they were tested, they had meetings with parents and professionals and the students and made the determination. Um, the outplacements and hospitalizations are just indicators of the level of need in our students. Is that to say that we don't have students that are having difficulty during this period? Absolutely not. But all of those students are being addressed individually by our professional staff who see them, have eyes on them and work with them every day, even if they're fully remote. If a parent is having a significant issue with their child and they haven't contacted the school, Sometimes the school may not be aware of a certain behavior at home. They, uh, we have always encouraged that and we would um, double down on encouraging that parents do that. Um, and we do have supports uh, for students and we are providing them for children that are experiencing difficulty. It's important to note that some students have exacerbated mental health issues in school environments, whether that is due to um, the um, tension between adolescents, whether it is um, boyfriend, girlfriend um, interactions, whether it is um, you know students not getting along with one another or the pressures of being in school and that we are not seeing as much this year. Um, and there are some benefits that our children are, um, are, are um, learning this year. In addition to resilience, they're also learning some very important computer skills. They're learning how to take turns. It's one thing to take turns in person and just grab it out of someone's hand. It's a lot different if you're doing that online and you really need to effectively get someone's attention, for example. Um, we've noticed some very significant advantages as well. With that said, we certainly aren't recommending this format and want to leave it as soon as possible, but under the circumstances, um, this is the data that represents some of the concerns that people have shared with us that we just wanted to make sure um, people were aware of the data specifically for Easton. Jackie. Thank you for getting that information together so quickly, Dr. Cabral. Um, with the, um, the SPED referrals, does that include referrals for IEPs and 504 plans or is that just for fi um, IEPs? That's for IEPs. Okay. Do you know- 504 um, is not um, special education. So do you know if there's been an increase in 504s? Do you have any idea about that? I can get that for you. Okay. And then if you could just, um, if Chrissy, if you could just um, send this presentation to all of us, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So uh, again, just a summary um, before um, I get to next steps for the district. The plan was um, created by our professionals who know our students best. Um, we had a lot of great cooperation from our colleagues in creating that. We are different than other districts, and I would, uh, I guess, boldly say that I think we are providing 
um, for our students the best model possible under the circumstances. And um, it's important to just remember that what is said about prevalence in the state may or may not be the reality of Easton, but it's important that we're using Easton statistics, anecdotal information, and professional uh, observations in order to make those determinations. Now, go ahead, Kristen. Okay. So, um, in terms of um, understandings going forward, why have we not already gone to five days in person instruction? Um, again, we feel as though um, our students would be going backwards based on what we have available to us in Easton. I talked about all of these issues at the last meeting, but I'm changing the term to understandings because at this point, our time is now limited. The Commissioner of Education is going to the Board of Health, uh, excuse me, is going to the Board of Education and is requesting to have the um, authority to determine what is structured learning time. Now, what that means is he will then have the authority to determine whether any computer time or time outside of school counts as structured learning time. If it does not, educators are bound by law to provide that structured learning time that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. We, if we did not change our structure, we would have to go to school on weekends. We would have to go to school all summer. We would have to continue into the fall, perhaps, uh, in evenings. Um, so it is obviously not advantageous to do that. Um, however, we still strongly believe, and you know, the commissioner did accept our plans immediately, both times that we presented them, we still believe that our students are getting structured learning time because our time is live with their classes and their teachers. So these are some of the understandings that people need to be aware of. Again, nothing here is new, but because we are now on a restricted timeline, if we were to go to five days a week for K to five tomorrow, for example, this is the reality and um, we want to make sure that all parents uh, are planning accordingly. So, um, for example, we still have some things we need to reconcile. Lunch and mask breaks, that requirement still remains at six feet. And so while many parents are telling me, but my child already eats in the classroom, what's the big deal? Can't they keep eating there? If children come back and they are spaced three feet apart in the classroom, which is the only way we can get them in the classroom, then no, they can't continue to eat in the classroom because the requirement remains six feet for lunch. If they are at six feet during the school day, then that works fine for lunch. But when they take their mask off for a mask break or for lunch, it does not work fine. And so we need to figure out how to offer lunch to uh, to these students, particularly when the weather is still inclement and we aren't um, eating outside like we were in the fall. It also has a furniture implication. Um, the reason for that is because in our PK to two schools and in our cafeterias, we have tables. The requirement still um, from DESE still requires us to not have students facing one another. So we can't use that furniture. If we do, the students are faced so far apart that we can't fit them in the room. So we need to replace tables with individual desks or seats or something. Um, we've talked about yoga mats and having students have class on a yoga mat or have lunch on a yoga mat. Um, and it is possible, but not the most comfortable for a child, but it is something that we're working on. We are still identifying spaces where that's possible because it's still not possible in this, many of the classrooms we have. Now, it's difficult to look at a classroom and say, well, it fits there. Why doesn't it fit everywhere? Because all of our schools and classrooms are different sizes, of course. So it's very different and we have to look at all of them. 
also full days. Um, the commissioner has said he wants full days. If we go to full days, we lose the staff planning time in the afternoon, which means we have to stagger staff planning throughout the day, um, like it was prior to COVID. That means that um, we don't have any facilitators. Um, that means we don't have remote into the classroom any longer. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Um, staff also needs to have lunch. Right now they have lunch with the students because they can have their planning in the afternoon when the students are traveling home. We wouldn't be able to do that anymore. I don't know if how many people have had the pleasure of working a lunch for five, six, seven, and eight-year-olds, but I can tell you from a great deal of experience that the entire period is spent opening milk cartons, um, putting straws into juice pouches, um, opening up packages, uh, spreading sauces in, in peanut butter and ketchup, and definitely not eating. That is a problem for us because we do not have the staff to provide that. We're already short on subs. So that is an area um, that we're, uh, again, still working on. We do not own our own buses like many districts do. So they may be able to redirect their buses or have them working extra hours. We do not physically have the vehicles. We have 17 at our disposal and that's it and they work in three tiers. So the pre-K to two, and then grades three to five, and then grades six to 12. Um, we're seeing right now that we may be able to make it work with different schedules. So for example, they're all perfectly staggered right now because they all leave um, in a little over an hour early every day. If the elementary students are going to 3.30, but the other schools are maintaining their schedule, we have to make sure that there's time in between runs to get all the students home from school and then back for the next run or into school and then out for the next run. Right now, we're seeing the biggest problem is that it's going to limit the transportation for middle school. So middle school, um, it would seem like K to five doesn't affect middle school, but right now it is. We have students at the middle school. You have to remember that we have students that are there for the full day. Um, and so there's many extra runs involved with that. And um, we're working to reconcile that. The state of Massachusetts does not require you to transport students in grades seven through 12. It is possible uh, if we cannot find a solution to that. Um, it is possible we would not be able to transport students um, 7 to 12 or any combination within those grades. Um, obviously, that's something we want to avoid, which is why we haven't done this yet. Uh, increasing time includes lunch and recess and individual work. Many people have asked me, well, why can't we just add to the day? In addition to losing the facilitators and the lunch and the furniture that I talked about, um, the afternoons, particularly for grades three and up, staying the rest of the day um, keeps them there for lunch and recess and not much more. So going home for that is really not a loss of structured learning time. The other time in the afternoon that they may be working on their own is time that they would have been working on their own in the classroom anyway. If anyone's ever been in an elementary classroom recently, you know the teacher does not stand there and talk to the students all day long. There are periods where a student goes on a computer, works on a, a computer program, they work on puzzles or read silently, or um, they complete a worksheet or a workbook, or they do an art project. The teachers have very skillfully been planning those things for the afternoons right now. So when people say that adding to the day is adding to the interactive and structured learning time, it really isn't because those individual activities will move back into the school day and the students will be doing them on their own at a desk, not with other students and not with the teacher. Those are normal parts of a day in every school in America um, for very intentional, purposeful reasons. Um, 
it's not going to be a normal experience. I want to make sure that parents are not surprised or shocked when their children go back to school. They are not going to have a normal experience. They cannot have recess like they used to have recess. They cannot work in small groups like they used to have small groups. In fact, when you see your child split into a small group with either a teacher or other students, they will probably be in the classroom on a computer in a small group with other students because they cannot be less than three foot apart, even by DESE standards. And so in order to make that work, many times it's going to include, and this is what other schools are doing when people say, how are other schools doing it? They're doing the same thing. The kids are in the building, but they're working with one another on computer screens, just in the building. And so I just wanna make sure that people are aware that that is not something that's gonna change for their children. They can't rub, run up and hug their friends. They can't um, play interactively with recess materials that they used to be able to. They won't be sitting on a rug reading and doing puzzles with, with one another. Um, and that is based on the three foot distancing, not even the six foot distancing. Staff vaccinations, we are told repeatedly, and I heard these commissioners say two times that, um, two times today, and um, two times the last time they had a press conference that staff is next. I just wanna be clear that staff is next after individuals who are 65 and older and individuals with two comorbidities. Um, just this, if you remember or have seen in the news or perhaps it's been your own personal experience, um, when it opened for 75 and plus citizens, that was a million people became eligible. There will be more than that for 65 plus and much more than that for people with two co comorbidities. Right now, the state of Massachusetts is getting 130 vaccines a week. They still have millions of people to vaccinate. Educators are likely not going to be vaccinated this school year to the point of being safe in a classroom. While we have been fighting for vaccinations for the safety of our staff so we could get students in at three feet much earlier, that has been set back three times. First, when citizens 65 and older were prioritized, which I am not arguing is wrong or right. I'm just saying it was a setback for staff. Second was when the governor allowed companions to bring anyone 75 and older, meaning your 1 million people effectively became 1.5 million. That's a very reserved estimate. And that may be the case for 65 and older people, uh, may be the case for people with comorbidities. We certainly don't know, and it changes often. The third setback was, despite the fact that we have been working around the clock and very collaboratively and successfully with the town to create a system where the town could and showed that they could effectively efficiently um, and quickly give one uh, between 250 and 300 vaccinations a day in the town of Easton. That would be two to three days for our entire staff. Um, as of March 1st, the governor has taken back the opportunity for any town or municipality to receive vaccines and to disseminate them in their own communities. This is a huge, huge setback, not just for educators, but for all citizens in the town. Instead, they're being allocated at the mass vaccination sites. We still strongly believe that um, the towns that have done this effectively can work in perfect tandem with the max mass vaccination sites instead of the mass vaccination sites. In, in fact, the entire system of companions bringing citizens would have been almost eradicated 
if people could have been transported within their own community to a senior center or other building that they know and trust with internal staffing, again, that they know and trust. Those are just three setbacks since February 1st in the um, ability for educators to be vaccinated. We do not know what is yet to come. So that is likely not going to happen. We also do not have substitutes available for the staff that's out now. Um, and we're not sure how we're gonna be able to maintain staffing once we have people in three feet apart from one another. Um, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. And the last set of understandings we believe are the most important because these are the educational implications. Remote learning is going to stop. That means remoting into the classroom, not an option for remote learning. The commissioner has made it clear that remote learning, full remote learning must remain an option for families. And we will make that an option. But if we go or when we go to five days fully in person, we will not have remote instruction into the classroom. It is not only unsafe, it is not effective. The reason it's effective now is because we have a facilitator in the room. We have five to seven or eight students in the room and the teacher is able to focus on those children and to help the students at home. If you now have 15 to 18 small children in a classroom without a facilitator, you have an adult that is tasked with teaching and supervising over a dozen small children with no adult help, they are not going to be teaching students online. It's not sustainable, it's not safe, and it would be ineffective. The options we have right now are that remote students, anyone who chooses to remain remote would have to enroll in an outside, with an outside vendor. Um, we don't know if this is accessible because many of the vendors operate on a school year and we don't know if the licensing is even available. If it is, it is extremely costly. These students are effectively separating from EPS staff because our staff do not run that. They're not allowed to run that. The staff of the organization runs that and um, some of them are not live at all. And so it's effectively a, a correspondent school. The other option we have available right now is one or two staff members at each grade level become remote teachers. That means that all remote students are taken from their classrooms, from their teachers and classmates and put in a remote class with an EPS teacher, which of course we prefer. However, the teacher now with um, limited time to begin with needs to learn who the students are, learn what their significant um, learning losses or challenges might be, what their strengths are, um, how they are performing, um, essentially like they would at the beginning of the school year. In addition, the staff member who, or st all of the staff members who become remote teachers would then have their students who are coming in hybrid um, be separated and reallocated to the remaining classrooms across the grade level. Um, those children would be in new classrooms, have new classmates, and again, um, would have to work with a teacher to um, understand where that child is at, what that child needs, um, and to meet them where they're, where they're at and help them grow through the rest of the year. Um, again, we continue to work on other options. We don't have any right now, which is why we have not done this yet. Um, as I've said repeatedly, we continue to look at this and we have, we have a meeting tomorrow, for example, with some principals that was scheduled long before the commissioner and governor's announcement. 
because we are soliciting this input from staff and they were to report out to us tomorrow, which they will still do and we'll still continue to work on this. This is simply, these are simply facts that I'm sharing that if we were to not have any other options before we are required to move, that this is what parents and children um, are to expect. It's very important that people understand um, when we start moving people, why we are moving them. Also, it's important to note that quarantines haven't changed. The governor, the state, the CDC, DESE, they all still say that a close contact is anyone within six feet. They may say three feet is safe for children in school. They still require us by mandate to report and exclude any student or staff member who is identified as a close contact. Um, that means that the students we separate now um, and the staff that we quarantine now would um, increase theoretically by double at least because you're going from six feet to three feet. Because we would are no longer going to have remote into the classrooms, those students on quarantine will not be participating in class. Um, they won't have direct instruction. We will try to keep them up to speed, of course, as we always do when anyone is sick or out of school for any period of time. But they will not be engaging in the classroom for the reasons we noted prior. As I said earlier, parent cooperation has been a huge part of helping us be successful in keeping our children safe. What we're afraid of is those parents who say, I'm not going to test my child, I'm just going to keep them home because I know they can still engage in the classroom. Without that option, we'll send their children to school. And we have a concern that that will increase the number of students who are in school that are either carriers or may in fact um, be positive for COVID themselves. Um, that is a concern. Obviously we don't have data on that because we've avoided that, um, but that is, um, that is definitely a concern. So um, again, this is, these are not, these are not doom and gloom scenarios. This is our current reality. We are not, threatening certainly and not saying that we're going to do things that we don't um, agree with but we're just explaining where we are right now none of this is new i've said all of this many times already but i'm putting it all in one place because we're running out of time and the timeline actually on the next slide is um the goal of desi's is K to five, five full days a week. The Board of Education is gonna vote on that within two weeks, so we don't even know if this is gonna pass, and we won't for another two weeks. Then DESE has said they will give us guidance in approximately two weeks or more. That gives us two weeks to implement this by April 1st. This is simply informative to let people know that if we are to go back, this is where we're at right now. Um, we believe this has the potential to be less effective for students, which is why we haven't gone ahead with it, but we will do it if it is the mandate, obviously. And we will always give 150% to every student like we always do. Um, but people have to prepare in terms of transportation and their children moving. Um, it would be extremely disingenuous to move forward without reminding people um, what is going to take place. It's very important for everyone to be well aware, and that's what this is. I'm, I'm sorry if... Um, 
people find this to be negative, this is our reality. Um, if people are embracing this and think it's a great idea, then, then that's good too. Then those people will be very happy about this. Um, are there any questions from the school committee about where we're at right now? Jackie? Thank you. Thank you for putting this together so quickly. Um, so I just have a few, a few follow-up questions. I want to start with the remote only students. And I, I understand that it hasn't really been worked out yet whether they would go to a program or whether be reassigned a teacher. Um, a question about the remote programs that other districts have been using. So if I understand they're not, they're no longer going to have a contact with an EPS teacher anymore. Is that correct? If we use the option that many school districts have used, um, again, when people say how are other districts doing it, that's how districts are doing it. They're paying um, a service and they are um, assuming responsibility for those students for this school year. So that is a possibility. We don't even know if we can get that licensing, but mm -hmm. that is what other districts are doing. So for something like that, um, who would do the evaluations? Would it be the online instructor? Would it, how would, how would that work? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, for like, normally we have parent teacher conferences, evaluations of the student. How would the evaluations of the student work? They wouldn't be done by an EPS employee. There would be um, written reports. Okay. Um, I can't tell you that there would be a meeting with a teacher because in some uh, cases there are there there is not direct instruction. It's more like um, I guess I don't know if I'm aging myself here, but it's more like a correspondence course that an adult may have taken in the past where they work um, from online material. And so what if a, the student is either on a 504 or an IEP, how would that work? Would they still be implemented or would it, I mean, how would that work? That would be extremely challenging. It would certainly depend on the services that are in the IEP. Um, we could potentially offer services after school um, once they're done. Um, certainly we can't have our staff doing that during the school day because they're gonna be reallocated to other students. Um, right. But again, we have to understand exactly who those students are and what is in their IEPs. They're highly individualized. And so it would certainly depend on what uh, the IEP called for. Um, and so do we have an idea of how much a program like that would cost and how we would, would it come out of our budget? Would it come out of COVID funds that were received? How would that work? Uh, it would come out of COVID funds. We don't know yet if we're getting another stimulus package. If we do, it could come out of that, but okay. that has not passed um, yet. That hasn't passed yet. And so if we have, so I understand with the three foot distancing, there's a, a greater likelihood that more will be quarantined more often just because of just double the people in the classroom. Um, and of course that may happen, may not happen, but what, so what would happen if a teacher in a classroom had to be quarantined? And I know you've had, you know, administrators filling in as subs when you couldn't get them, but what if there was no one available to teach that class? Would then the whole class have to go out until you could find somebody to come in or how would that work? It depends. If a staff member is ill, we certainly can't have them work even remotely. Um, if they're a close contact, perhaps they could work remotely with the class, but if the teacher is present and only some of the students in the class are quarantined, then the entire class does not go remote. But if the teacher had to go out and you couldn't, but even if you, could even if you had the teacher out and he or she was, um, a close contact and they could theoretically still teach remotely, you still have to have a body in the classroom because it's elementary, right? Correct. What if you didn't have a body in the classroom? Then we have to shut down the classroom. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so 
contact tracing. So I'm guessing that could amp up a little more with this. How do we have we found more people to be contact tracers and how are we paying them from COVID funds? How does that work? Uh, no, we don't have extra contact tracers. We don't, we are doing it with current staff. Again, it would effectively double because if you look at students that are six feet away and you change that to three feet or, or less, um, you're obviously increasing the number of students in that area. Now, we have consistently had students who are positive in classes, consistently. Um, you know, I get questioned a lot, if the kids are sit sitting six feet away, how can anybody be a close contact? Well, the Board of Health, who we work very closely with, has um, that came into our schools, looked at our desks, looked at our seating, especially with young kids, said, a student doesn't sit in a chair and remain static for a day. They lean sideways, they go forward, they lay on the desk, they lean back on the chair. They're breaking that six foot barrier. So we get anyone who is seated six feet away with the understanding that it's possible they have been exposed. Obviously, if students are three feet away, you are doubling the number of children. You're going to get the student that's three feet away and the student that's six, three feet seating and six foot seating. Um, so it at least doubles the amount of kids. I say at least because now, instead of just counting the students in front, behind, and to the sides of the child, now you're counting the students on the diagonal. And so it effectively, mathematically, could be more than double um, the number of children. Now that doesn't mean double the number of children who are sick. It means double the number of children that we are mandated to exclude from school and identify as close contacts. So that would be more children um, out of school. And unfortunately, without the remote option, um, they, they just would be out of school for two weeks. In addition, it's not just two weeks. We have had this most significant issue in this district has been family spread, which is why I, I didn't point it out, but you could easily go back and see that the, the um, populations right after zero through 19 up through 45 has the next most amount in the community that represents most of our parents ages so if a child has two or three siblings and lives in the house with even one parent or two if they're a close contact to someone in school they would be out for two weeks if somebody in their home becomes positive that starts again. Oh, okay. If a sibling then becomes positive, it starts again. And we have had students out from two weeks to over two months because it has run rampant in their home wow. with several siblings, their parents, and then ultimately if they get it, then they have an isolation period. Um, that would all be time strictly outside of school. Um, and then I just um, want to ask a little follow up about lunch because I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So I'm I'm gonna look at RO just because that's how my my familiarity right now. So normally we have three lunches, right? Third, fourth, and fifth, and all the whole third grades together. The whole fourth, right. so would we split them up so instead of like three lunches, we would have six lunches. Is that a possibility? Yes. And then you have to have, I assume, cleaning time in between each lunch? Correct. How, is that like a 10 minute thing, a 30 minute thing? Depends on the size of the school and what furniture we get in there. Okay. Um, we were told that we couldn't just put up plexiglass on every table and separate the kids that way because um, it increases the surface area for the virus and each of those areas would need to be cleaned and there's no way to clean individual cubbies okay. in a cafeteria. Um, so it would effectively 
potentially extend lunch periods um, from what amounts to an hour and a half to potentially three hours a day. Yeah, that's what I was trying to calculate. So I, if there were six lunches, they're each a half hour, that's three hours plus the cleaning before and after do, doesn't affect it, but then there would be four cleanings in between. So lunch would be over a four hour period approximately? Approximately. Okay. When they're not outside, yes. So a child could be having um, brunch basically, and another child might be eating right before they leave school. Okay, and then in addition to that, they're still, are they still gonna have a mask break or will the lunch constitute the mask break? Uh, we have to determine how we're gonna have mask breaks because they can't have them in the classroom if they're three feet apart, it's against regulations. Okay, and you said the three feet is measured from seat to seat, is that? Correct, DESI, DESI measures them from seat to seat. Okay. So they could, in effect, their desks could be almost touching, which for littles is extremely enticing uh, to extend your borders mm -hmm. and um, get closer together. And then I assume, I, I know you've been talking about with the bus companies about transportation. Would that, would we have to do a new? contract with the transportation or does it just need to be tweaked or we don't know yet we we only have 17 buses for easton so if we need right now we're finding we don't have enough buses um so that's not going to change uh, our bus vendors do not have more buses for us okay. and we certainly can't purchase vehicles right now okay and they don't have drivers. We're having trouble even having all of the drivers in at a time because of COVID. Um, so it's a vehicle issue as well as a con contractual issue, but it's more so it's a time issue. It's the same buses that go in all three runs. So when you change one, it affects everything. Yeah. Now, when you have all of your three schools stacked at a certain time and you move all of them forward, it works. When you leave some of them behind and you move some forward, it doesn't necessarily work. And that's what we're trying to figure out right now. And, and what about the sped vans? Are those, is it the same issue with them? Or? Same exact issue, yes. Okay. Um, and then, uh, what else was I going to ask you? Oh, and so I assume a new agreement would have to be negotiated with all of the unions as well because we're changing the model. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay. And then, shoot, what was my last question? <laughs> now I can't remember. I'm not um, going anywhere. You can write it down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what my last question was. Oh, well. Okay. Thank you. Jen. Jen, go ahead. Jen, you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you for okay. the presentation. It, uh, I think, consolidated a lot of information that people have been seeking, and hopefully um, people find it helpful. So just to clarify, the DESE plan, the DESE proposed mandate is for K through five, correct? Correct. At this point? Yes. Okay. So the schedule changes that we're talking about to get, you know, to go from, to get everybody in full day, five days a week, we're talking about that specifically for K through five? By and April leaving... 1st, and then the commissioner has said possibly middle school after that and possibly high school after that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I had a couple of follow-ups to some of the stats from earlier in the presentation um, around special ed evals and hospitalizations. So for the special ed evaluation numbers, I know there was a backlog of, um, or 
my understanding is that earlier in the year, mm -hmm. because of the closure last year, there was a backlog in evaluations. Right. Do we know if that has been resolved? Have they been able to catch up and address everything that was requested? They have, but since that is not, um, we didn't put that in our figures because those are not new evaluation requests. Those are from last year. Okay. But yes, okay, they great. have been able to catch up. Okay. And then for hospitalizations, that data is when is, is for like inpatient admissions, right? When we get Correct. requests for tutoring, things like that. Okay. All right. So, because I'm Only hearing, for I know. Only emotional needs. We did not include physical um, needs. Only emotional since the okay. concern for many is the social emotional yep. needs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I have, I know anecdotally uh, there are families whose kids are being boarded in the ER for a couple of nights and then sent home instead of getting mm -hmm. a longer term admission, kind of given the scenario that we're in. So just wanted to know if you, if there's a way, I don't, there wouldn't That's be a way to account No, that, that is anymore. included. It is. Okay. Yes. So the, so the ER. A, a hospitalization overnight or whatever. Is yes. Because okay. right. frankly, they have been included because um, sadly, even before this year, there just were not enough beds anywhere. And we've had students mm -hmm. literally in emergency rooms for several weeks. Yeah, It's a mental health crisis in this country, not COVID related, of course. Yep, okay. All right, I think Jackie got all the rest of my questions. So uh, I have nothing else right now. Caroline? Well, I, I just wanted to say that you made a very tiny uh, mistake earlier when you said that we're the state is only getting 130 vaccines a week. It's 130,000. 130, no, I, I assumed most people would realize that you didn't mean 130, but I just thought in Thank case you. someone out there thought, oh my gosh, we're practically getting no vaccine at all, uh, that I'd, well, I'd mention that. Compared to the fact that there are millions who need it. It is a very small right. number, but oh, it is. not it 130. Is. You are correct. Anyways, well, it's frustrating. The other thing, I, I, um, I'm i glad that you made the statement about the fact that uh, for, for some children, it's actually the school environment itself that creates stress, anxiety, and, you know, other mental health challenges. So that it's, um, you know, there's, there's no doubt that many youngsters are suffering during this time when they're not able to be with their peers and their teachers and so on. And, and certainly their families are as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's fine. My daughter's a teacher in Connecticut and she actually mentioned to me several weeks ago that people don't think about those children that actually have even breakdowns and it's really related to the school environment itself. So it's, it's not as simple as to say, you know, the current situation is what's creating all of the issues around, you know, social emotional challenges for kids. Anyway, that's that's all I wanted to and, um, comment on. Thank you. Actually, two things about that. One is that we have evidence that we have quite a few students that are thriving under this model for some of the reasons that you noted. But also, um, when a student is facing significant social emotional needs, they're evaluated thoroughly by our professionals. It isn't always just school. And going back to school does not solve the issue. Our children are seeing our adults in our um, state, in our country, um, effectively fighting with one another, physically and verbally. They are seeing stress. Um, in their families, in their neighbors, in their friends. They see the news. They see that people are dying. They have to wear a mask everywhere. They can't just go to the movies like they have in the past. They can't go to a concert. They can't go out and, and, and play with their friends like they have before. None of that gets resolved when students are back in school. So we don't want to mislead anyone that when students return, um, they can expect that things will be normal. Even school won't be normal. As I said before, they're still going to wear masks. Their recess, their lunch, 
you know, people are counting on socialization at lunch, those children are going to be six feet apart from one another when they have lunch. And that is the mandate. Um, they, please do not envision school last year. It is going to be very different. And I'm not saying it won't be advantageous for some students. I just want the expectations to mirror reality so that we are being transparent and clear with people so they know exactly what to expect and, and what not to expect. I think that is extremely important as we move forward that we're all on the same page here and we continue to support our students regardless of whether they're in school or not. Okay, um, I have a couple questions. First of all, I like the idea of the grade level remote teachers. Um, in my mind, um, let's say RO, you had one third grade teacher that maybe even um, had or one fourth grade teacher, one fifth grade teacher, and they have maybe, you know, um, they're, they're worried about getting sick and maybe they're, they would prefer to teach from home. So the kids that couldn't be in the third grade, they would be part of their class. Um, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. You so, are. But first okay. of all, the commissioner requires all educators who are working with students, even if they're working remotely, to do it from school. That is the okay. commissioner's requirement. Okay. But, okay. All right. So you couldn't have, all right. So then you But would they could work remotely from a classroom. Right. Yes, absolutely. Okay. It's the children that are going to be displaced. Um, whoever that teacher had in their class to this point wouldn't be that teacher's students anymore. They would all go to other teachers in that grade level. And then um, that teacher then would have all new students being the remote students, of course, that right. decide to stay remote. Right. And, but the other thing, too, I'm thinking about is um, that, you know, I mean, everybody's been through an upheaval since last March anyway. I don't, if you're, if you're doing third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade or pre-K to two, whatever it is, I mean, you're, they're, they're working on the same stuff, you know, they're working on contractions and adding and multiplying, whatever they're doing. So kids, I, I think the way their class is now, I don't know that that would be a huge deal to be moved from the teacher that they have now. They're all, you know, their previous teacher could check in with them or whatever. I know there's a lot to be worked out, but I do like that idea a lot, as opposed to hiring a company. And as I said at the last meeting, if you're going to hire a company and you still have to buy desks and you still have to pay for this and pay for that, I don't think we have the money, even if we get federal funding. Anyway, next and question. We agree with you, by the way. Of course, we want all our children to have EPS teachers. Um, the problem with using our own teachers is that the teachers that have been able to share their input on this are very distressed at the idea of losing their students and very sure. distressed at the idea of getting other students. They are very limited in time this year. They know exactly where the kids are at. Yep. They know what they still need to work on. So while they might all be teaching contractions, um, every teacher knows intimately where each person in that room is right now and where they need to go. And that would take time to learn it. I, I totally understand. I'm just, sharing, I'm just sharing the staff input on okay. that. Okay, but I'm just saying all the kids being in school, well, not all of them, but the kids that want to come back, you know, would, I think that would like kind of 50, 50 it out, but whatever. Um, I had a question. You were talking about the facilitators. Now, I know the high school doesn't use a lot of facilitators. Would it be easy? I mean, at the high school level, where could they have a class with, you know, the three feet apart and have a couple kids on the computer watching the class at the high school level? Because they're so not using facilities. We're just talking about K to five right now, because that's the no. commissioner's directive. So we haven't gone there yet. We've well okay. we have gone there. We've of course been thinking about it ever since school started, but right now we're focusing on K to five. Okay. And then my last question about the lunch and not dragging it out for four hours. What about if 
So it would be four. The tents, what about getting tents for lunch? We um, tried to do that in the fall um, and we were denied um, permission to do that by the town. But, there are right. some fire regulations and some structural regulations that um, just did made that not possible. We've tried. I'm, to not, I'm not talking about a circus tent. I'm talking about. I'm no, talking we got about the exact measurements of what we could have, and it was denied five or six times. What do you think it would be denied again now? Now that um, restaurants have um, almost every restaurant has put up some kind of. Um, tent or something outside, you know, um, their... there are very different regulations for children than there are for adults. And um, I, it's not by choice. I'm sh I know, you know, the town is, we've been working very collaboratively. It's not that they didn't want to do it, but I doubt that the fire codes and building codes have changed. Obviously, we're going to continue to keep working on it, but that has been our experience and why we didn't use tents in the fall. Okay, thank you. Michelle, did you want to ask anything? I'm still really trying to process it. Um, I do agree with you that if we, we make this move that we try to make it work with our own teachers, I have seen the other model not work well at all. Um, and, and I think that I would feel very strongly advocating for. I, I, I don't want to find the other model. Your the other model meaning the the um, the fully remote students using a different platform, correct? Yes, like ingenuity or something. Right. That that just I I would not advocate for that in any way, shape, or form. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm going back and forth a little bit on supporting April. So I, I kind of want to think about it some more before I make comments. Thank you. Caroline? I just wanted to add a little bit to what Alicia said about the tents. I was part of that <laughs> facilities committee and we did talk about that at great length, but apparently there's a real risk that the, the tents can blow over if there's a wind or whatever, and that was considered really a deal breaker in terms of you know having tents up. So it, it was something that was looked into very carefully, repeatedly early on. Um, great idea in concept, but just it just does not meet fire code and other regulations for students. No, just just trying putting that out there to reduce, you know, if the kids come back K to five, pre-K to five. And you want them not to have, you know, lunch at 10 and lunch at two, you know, just trying to make the, I don't know. Well, we had kids, we had kids eating outside though. Uh, yeah. Oh, I know. You know, I, when the weather was decent. Right. They brought but, their uh, and, and you can't, you can't have a closed tent to, to keep out the wind and the cold because that doesn't, that's the same. I mean, that doesn't reduce the risk, yeah. you know, because yeah. of the aerosol. So you have to have at least one side fully open anyway. And that was part of the issue about the wind and everything. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I think, unfortunately, it's throwing it out there. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, did you finish out? Did you figure out what your question was? I, Jen actually asked it, but I do have a couple of other questions. Um, the, the first one is my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if, if Commissioner Riley gets the approval from the DESE board, then districts don't have a choice that if we stayed in a hybrid or districts that stayed in fully remote that he would deny that being time on learning is that correct correct and so, we've been working on getting our students back since the beginning of the year we just didn't find that the our current reality that i shared was better for students than that and so we continue to work on it um i'm just saying if we don't have an alternative by april 1st that that this is the expectation this is the okay. expectation um and my other question has to do with mcas where do things stand with that the federal government has not allowed 
uh, legislation to let states opt out of mandatory testing. And so what they are doing is letting states choose to test for shorter periods of time. Uh, Massachusetts has already done that. So they have shortened the MCAS testing window um, and that's all that they're allowed to do right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, go ahead, Caroline. I may have misunderstood. I listened not to today's press conference, but the one that uh, where uh, Commissioner Riley announced this plan for April. And my understanding was he's getting approval from the board to seek permission from the legislature to um, essentially create this requirement for schools. So I think it's a little bit of an open question depending on what other kinds of advocacy occur in relation to the legislators, whether this will um, happen just as Commissioner Riley and perhaps Dr. Governor Baker uh, envision it, unless I misunderstood. I didn't think that it was just that Riley could himself mandate anything. I think that it was that he was getting permission from the board to go before the legislature no, to make no. these requests. That's, no? That's, no, that's for testing. Um, so he is not requesting permission to mandate any certain amount of days or grades in person. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for the Board of Education to give him the authority to determine what is structured learning time and what isn't structured learning time. That's all he's looking okay. for. However, what that does effectively is allow him to determine what will count and what will not count. So he doesn't have to say everyone will come back five days a week. He just has to say the hours on a computer do not count. Make it up another way. You can do that by going five days a week or you can, the example he gave was you can do that by going on Saturdays or going all summer long or some other way of doing it. He just needs to get the Board of Health, uh, Board of Education approval on structured learning time. Okay, may I ask then, where do, I mean, obviously we work collaboratively with our unions when we, uh, when there is a change in work conditions being proposed. And where does that leave the unions? If, if Riley then would have somehow the authority to change the direct in person, you know, to change the learning time and define it as only in person learning at in the classroom learning. Um, you, I know that in the past, you know, there have been mandates, so called mandates, but then we were told as a district, you still need to negotiate with the union. So even though it's a mandate, it's really a kind of odd catch 22 situation for, for district administrators and school committees, because sometimes we're given a mandate, but told, but you still get have to get the union to agree. But if you don't have any extra funding or other resources to offer incentives, sometimes that's not so simple. So I'm wondering, you know, where Right. Has Riley talked at all about where he sees the union role here? Because they certainly need to be at the table. The union and we are bound by law to satisfy minimum student learning time. He is effectively giving them the choice of providing that five days a week or on Saturdays in the summer. We do not have the money to provide it Saturdays in the summer. As you can imagine, it is not feasible for people to get an entire staff here and commit to Saturdays in the summer. So while they have a choice, so to speak, they can do one or the other or be breaking the law. That is the position that we find ourselves in right now. The mandate has the force of law. Structured learning time is law in Massachusetts. Time on learning, yes. So if he's given authority to determine what is counting as structured learning time, it is effectively the law. Okay. 
Hey, Carolyn. Yeah, I, I mean, and did you, you said April 1st. I hadn't gotten that impression from listening to the um, press conference. It sounded like it, it could be later in April, but my big concern is that we have April vacation. And as you alluded to, there's no reason to think we wouldn't have an uptick in community spread because of people traveling during April vacation. So, um, but was that April 1st date actually stated? I, I must have missed that. No, I spoke to him yesterday. He said April 1st. Okay, thank you. That's, okay, I'm finally done, Nancy. Thank you. <laughs> Don't, that's, you can be on as long as you want. All right, um, anybody else right now? Okay, so um, I'm gonna repeat. Uh, this meeting is on Zoom, Facebook, li Facebook Live, and ECAT. And you, uh, if you're on the Zoom meeting, you can submit your questions into the Q&A. You need your name and address um, with your question and we will not field any questions containing profanity or inappropriate language. If a question has been asked and answered, we will not address it again. Now, it's my understanding that the Zoom meeting was capped at 100, and there- We've are... had more than 100 people here, so I don't know why. Oh, We okay. just had 107 attendees and eight panelists about five minutes ago. Okay, great. So-, so I don't. Those... I guess we didn't they, cap anything and the town okay. has control over the Zoom, so we can't do anything about it. But I just saw 108 people. So, okay. So, so if you are on, explain that. Yeah. If you are on ECAT or maybe Facebook Live, if you want to email my, my email a question about tonight's meeting, then after Chrissy goes with the public comment, then I'll see if, you know, just email Angeluca at easton.k12.ma.us, okay? And if you have a question that hasn't been asked or answered. Okay, public comment. Chris, and uh, Dr. Gabral, thank you um, uh, for that presentation. That um, was very good. Uh, Chrissy, public comment. Sure. So the first one is Brian Manville, 10th Row Drive. I asked this last meeting. It was not answered during the meeting. I followed up with an email. The email was spoken around. I will ask again. Since you have given up on full-time in-person learning this year, given seven months until the next school year, will you be using those seven months to plan how to get all the kids in school next year full-time, or will you keep ignoring them, request of the parents, and use the same plan you used this year? So I will repeat what I said, Mr. Mandeville, at the last meeting and in my emails to you, that we have not stopped looking for solutions. I just articulated what the plan is going to be come April 1st, if we don't have anything different. Uh, if you came into the meeting late, um, nope, you wrote that at 6.04. Um, you may want to see the recording that says exactly what's going to happen. And I also, um, will repeat from the email that I said, we have every intention to consider September a regular school year. And I'm not sure um, how to elaborate on that. Your experience in the September of the 1819 school year would be the experience this September. I, I'm not sure how to clarify that. Obviously, if we are mandated to close schools or do something different, we must comply. I have no control over that. Um, I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding your question, but I don't know how to make that more clear unless someone here interprets that question differently and can give me advice on how to answer that more clearly. The next question is Erica Mandel, 50 Main Street. So it's clear this year is a wash. You have said repeatedly that next year you plan on next year being normal. How do you plan on all these issues to not be issues then? We expect our staff to be vaccinated. We expect our students to be able to sit at tables and face one another. We expect three feet or less to not be an issue. If any of that changes, obviously we don't have control over that, but that's why I consider it to be normal. Um, I'm only going by what our federal and state government is telling us. I'm certainly not a medical expert, but as you may be aware, they have said that they expect to um, have most people vaccinated by the end of July, that is before September, 
And so that is our plan. Lauren Romario, Benson Circle. The socialization of recess and lunch is so important. I would think this should be a priority, sending kids home for lunch alone. Um, again, we are not in control of the mandates for lunch. We have to keep children six feet apart at lunch. There's limited socialization that children are able to experience at six feet apart, but that is a mandate, including from DESE, that we are um, compelled to comply with. Lauren Romero, Benson Circle also asked, if a parent volunteers for each class to be the lunch person, would that help? If that parent is temp checked and provides negative COVID tests, I'm sure plenty of parents would be willing to volunteer their time. Um, we do not have enough parents to volunteer. We do not, we are not able to have someone coordinate volunteers. We are very understaffed as it is. And we have stopped volunteers in the school in order to reduce the amount of cross-contamination in the building. Um, many people in many doctors in Massachusetts have acknowledged that the temperature taking is not actually effective in this arena. So that would actually not help us. And that would effectively mean that more adults are coming into the building. Um, and our problem is we don't have enough room for the kids to come into the building. So it would just be taking up more space, though we very much appreciate the offer. Um, we have been advised that that would be more dangerous to our students and staff. Sandy Centuro, 38 Wilbur Street. When looking at the student data, wouldn't it be best to compare this year's data to the 2018-19 school year when the children had a normal schedule in order to see the full effect that COVID has had on learning? as opposed to the 1920 school year when COVID interrupted learning in March, or was the data provided for the 1920 school year from the time period prior to March? Yes, it I, was for the comparable time period. Yes. That is, that is exactly what we did. And also you'll see in the data that um, grade seven did show the 1819 school year. Grade four, grade four, they didn't take the STAR assessment in the, um, second grade, which would have been the 1819 school year for them. Um, but I also just want to note that I'm very interested in next year's data because I think that that will, I think we'll be able to really tell the learning loss um, or the learning gaps more with the data from next year as well. So we'll continue to monitor that. Um, Allison Piantadosi, 27 Priscilla, Priscilla Road. Dr. Cabral, you are continuously saying all negative comments, but have not shown slides for why this would be good and how this could work. Only showing negative slides and not both sides puts fear in families' heads. This can happen when if we put as much time as you did during the live remote learning, we can make this happen. You should be neutral. Tell families both sides. Uh, we have put in as much time as we have on the original plan. That's what we do. Um, every day and every night. We have been doing that and we haven't stopped. Um, and they're not negative slides, they're our reality. They, it is what is happening right now. COVID is a negative thing. And I believe that it is very important to be transparent with people. I just wanna add also that, you know, oftentimes when we're speaking with our administration, that we're, you know, ideas are popping up and we're starting. And then all of a sudden, one of those realities that Dr. Cabral had listed comes in and we say, oh, we can't do that. It's, it's like, it's the, I felt what Dr. Cabral had stated, it's really important to understand that all of those are hindering many plans that have kept emerging. And the, this is our reality. This is what we live with every day that we're trying to get these kids back. We're trying to find ways to support our teachers so that you know the, the, the students are, are safe, the teachers are safe, our staff are safe. And we kept getting hit with all of these, these, um, these potholes for lack of a better way to explain it. I mean, they're really stopping the way that we're able to move forward. And that's, that's what I think, you know, when Dr. Cabral pr presented that tonight, it's the reality of what we are facing every single day. And while it looks like it's negative, that's what keeps stopping us. 
And I think that that's, that's just important. I just wanted to highlight that. I also want to point out that I believe that the data we showed about the mental health of our students, the special education referrals and the academic achievement were all positive. I think they were extremely positive, especially in light of a pandemic. I think our staff is doing what they need to do and they are keeping our kids up to speed, even right. though we're enduring this crisis. And, and it's also I think that's extremely positive and I don't want that to go unnoticed. But it's also not negating the mental health issues that that students are facing in their homes. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, that I think that when, you know, parents are seeing their kids having outbursts when they don't typically, they haven't typically had outbursts. You know, I know myself as a parent, I'm constantly thinking about you know, ways to, to help my children because they're, they are, they're stuck inside. They're stuck in the house. Mm -hmm. They, you know, especially during the winter, during the bad weather, they, my, I have two boys, they get outside as much as they can. They were, have been stuck inside and they're left to, you know, to just sit there. And it's, it's been very, very trying for, for everyone. Um, Lisa Maggot, 18 Ruley, Ro Julie Road. With the state's plan of opening of facilities, increasing capacity to larger groups of people, when will decisions be made for events for our graduating seniors, prom, senior awards, graduation, senior trip? Um, the dates were on the governor's orders. They are March 1st and March 22nd, and all of the activities under them are listed there. So um, that is something that can be read online and um, we can't do anything until those dates. Um, so we have to, it's not that time yet. So we have to wait and make sure that that is actually allowed on that date. Lauren Loomis for Abbey Road. Sorry if this was already answered. If when we go five days, three feet, would contact tracing be conducted the same method, collective number of minutes of close contact over the course of the day? Yes, again, that's per regulations from the CDC and DESE. No one disagrees with that or has changed that. And so that would be the same. We're required to do that, in fact. Ginger LeMay, King Arthur Road. Are there any thoughts, opportunities for extracurricular safe ways for kids to be together? Weather permitting, could perhaps outdoor kickball or badminton or a walking club, maybe through the rec department or parent volunteers. Thank you for your time. Yes, these are things that we do with students when they're with us. And these are exactly the kinds of things that we encourage parents to do when the children are home, whether it's during, during vacation periods or after school or on the weekends, there's nothing that keeps parents from doing these activities with their children. We, however, don't run the rec department um, and we don't have a, a parent volunteer coordinator, but um, we strongly recommend that that is exactly what parents do, is engage in safe outdoor activities the way that we do in the schools. And uh, there shouldn't, if a parent is concerned about social interaction, there shouldn't be any reason why they aren't doing that. Kathleen Sheehan, Harrison Avenue. In the most recent case in Melrose, state arbitrators determined that the decision of whether to switch learning models isn't one that could be collectively bargained. As a result, why would a change to offering full in-person instruction need to be negotiated with the union? Um, I think I already answered that. We said that we do have an MOA that is at six feet right now. Um, you are correct. None of the bargaining, this is not a collective bargaining contract. It's what's called, um, you are you're bargaining the working conditions and that is mandated. So if, if for example, staff is mandated to go from six to three feet, you have to bargain the conditions, the change in working conditions. What do you do to provide safety for staff? What do you do to provide confidence for staff? Maybe we provide whatever that is, more PPE, more cleaning, whatever it is. But that is part of what bargaining is. It's not collective bargaining as a contract. You are bargaining working conditions and that is required. Alan Brown, Josie's Way, is it your decision to return the kids to school or is it the teacher's union? Mm, I'm not sure what that question, I'm not sure what that question means. 
I think he's looking to see who decides when the kids go back. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Ultimately, that is my decision. But we have a um, we have a cooperative and collaborative culture in Easton. We work very closely with all of our bargaining units. We, it's not just teachers. We have six collective bargaining units and many individual 30 something individual contracts. So we work with all of them and we do it collaboratively because they're the ones working with students. They can help us find any potential fit, pitfalls or problems or ways to keep them safe. And um, so while the responsibility ultimately is mine, uh, we all work in collaboration with one another. Kathleen Sheehan, Harrison Avenue. The current incident rate for Easton is 28.9, which puts Easton solidly in the CDC's yellow category. Thank you, we will check that. Jennifer Troy, 200 Bay Road. You are in a leadership position. You just did an entire presentation to spread fear about our kids being forced into a terrible situation in April. How is this helpful? If that makes you fearful, um, that is our reality. We are not recommending this. This is why we haven't done it yet. We've been trying to find better solutions. But if we are mandated to do it, this is what we're doing. And so we're just making it clear to everyone that we need to prepare and people need to be aware of what we are being mandated to do. Um, this is just reality. This, I'm not trying to strike fear in anyone. We're going to protect our kids regardless. We're going to teach our kids regardless. We're going to be there for the social emotional needs of every child, just like we always are. Um, but if we're mandated to make a move in April right now, uh, this, this is the move. This is what we're doing. So it is extremely important that people know about that now. I don't believe in not being transparent. Tom Corey, 59 Arbor Way. This one specifically for school committee. Um, has the Easton School Committee and or teachers voiced their concern about student performance this year, particularly student performance at home as opposed to in person? There's a second part to that question. Do you want me to read the second part too? Um, it um, says, I'll, I'll answer the first part. Um, I, I'll speak for myself, but as a committee, I'm not aware. Nobody has contacted me about student performance. Okay. The second part is many of us parents are frustrated with the minimum amount of time spent in school. Kids are suffering being isolated. Can you please let me know if anyone on the committee Please let me know if if there is anyone on the committee that is willing to speak up and advocate for our children to go back to school. I believe the committee speaks up every week. We all want the kids to be back in school full time, but we trust that our administrators give us the best health information again tonight and the previous meetings. Uh, we're standing up for your children and for our teachers and our administration. And we do want everybody to be back in school full time with, with being healthy. I, I don't know what else there is to say. If anybody, Jen, go ahead. Sure, Nancy, if you don't mind my adding. Um, go right yes, ahead. Of course, we've had, of course, we've had concerns about student performance, and I was glad to see the statistics tonight that bore out that um, that performance issues are not as uh, as deep as we had feared or suspected would happen with such a drastic change in model. Uh, that said, as the parent of students, I am certainly well aware from a first person standpoint that this is difficult. I talked to teachers, guidance counselors on you know, behalf of my own kids and I hear from my peers of the struggles that their children are having. So I'm certainly well aware of this as is anybody and everybody who's working with children in this district. It's, it's a top priority, but I wanna address particularly your question about student performance at home as opposed to in person. Um, 
one of the biggest concerns I have about this mandate to move forward with fully in-person five-day week is the terrible trade-off I see for our students who cannot attend in person. And I don't think um, that we can simply dismiss the very real difficulty that having students quarantining without access to hybrid classrooms and our students who are not safe returning to um, an in-person model this year and who will have to be fully virtual, uh, that's not something that we can just dismiss and say, well, it's a small minority of students. It's better for everybody else possibly to be more in-person. That's a trade-off that I take very, very seriously. And I, I know everybody here does. And as Dr. Cabral was transparent in explaining, there's no good solution there. And that's a huge hurdle with being able to get more students in school is that trade-off that would happen without having what has been a really robust hybrid learning program with live remote learning that has benefited all of our students. Jackie? Um, so with regard to um, student, um, how students are doing at home versus in school. Yeah, I think we've, we ask questions all the time about, um, you know, the data and the STAR assessments that are done are really helpful in, in kind of letting us know what's going on. As for getting kids back in school, uh, Jen, Jen and I both have kids in the school system. We are, we have friends, all of our friends have kids in the school system. We are very aware of how kids and families are suffering through this. I can't even get into what I have had to deal with in my home. It's an awful situation. We are all struggling and we are all aware that what's going on now is not, is, is not good for anyone. I'm not sure going back five days a week. I think maybe there will be some kids that will definitely benefit from that. There may be some kids that don't, the kids that have to be quarantined, that's a concern. But until we can get back to normal, kids being able to in, in, interact with each other and work with each other and not wear masks and not have to stay apart, it's, it's, it's going to be a struggle no matter what we do right now until we can get back to what is more normal. And I, I think to, to expect this to just kind of poof away, putting them back five days a week, it's just not going to happen. I mean, hopefully it will get better, but I think this, the social emotional component of what our kids are going through, this isn't something that's just going to automatically go away. I think this is, we're going to be struggling with this for, for several years and just because of the year that we have all been through and that we continue to go through no matter what the learning model is. So of course we're concerned about that. And of course we think about this, we're living it too. I, I don't want you to think that we just kind of tune out and just go along with whatever's presented to us. We, we, we research, we talk to people, we, we're trying to figure this out too. We just, there's just no, easy, simple answer. There are complications to whatever we do. And we're just trying to work through that and figure out the best way to do this. So I just wanted to um, go back to the data. I don't know if people were here earlier will remember me saying this or if they weren't, if they watch this later and um, hear me say this. But um, I did say that um, the data for this evening was not out at five o'clock and we had to meet at five o'clock. I did predict that it would be in the yellow because it is representative of the February vacation week when most of our families, um, well, they weren't in schools, but many of our families were also traveling. So um, it's not surprising at all, but the commissioner did say and has said many times that we should be using no less than three data collection points to make decisions. Um, I also predicted that we will be going back to orange as, uh, now that people have returned from vacation. Um, that remains to be seen. Regardless, it doesn't have any, it doesn't, it's a, it's a moot point if everyone's, if K to five is going back April 1st. I just wanted to point out that, um, that 
that was predictable. Um, it isn't surprising at all. Um, we're going to keep close look at next week and the following week as well. Uh, Kathleen Sheehan, Harrison Avenue. One, if teachers remain six feet apart from students, wouldn't that limit how often a teacher would need to be quarantined as a close contact? Uh, yeah, if we if we have room. Some of our rooms, if the students are three feet apart, there isn't six feet of room in the front of the classroom, and we have removed all furniture other than desks. Um, but it's students that we're concerned about as well. Um, if students are three feet or part it's the students um if a whole class is out they actually could potentially as long as the staff member's not sick and it's able to be done they could work remotely as a class it's students being out when the teacher's present with other students um, we are concerned because they will not be able to engage in the classroom uh, remotely and they will be out of school for however long they need to be quarantined or isolated I also just want to add that it's very difficult as a former elementary school teacher to remain in one spot um, for the entire day for just educating young learners that oftentimes a teacher will be will be going about the classroom to ensure that their children are on task, as well as um, uh, just completing the assignments that they're that they're working on so it's hard just to stay in one place and during my observations that was also something communicated to me by our staff that it's very difficult for the, the staff of, of our youngest learners to stay six feet apart from the kids. I would say that's true of high school too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but definitely, I mean, an elementary teacher is tying shoes and yeah. handing out band-aids and helping students who trip and fall down. It's, it's almost impossible to remain six feet apart, but certainly we, we are whenever possible and however possible. And then number two, if a class has 15 students return in person and two remain remote, hypothetically, why can't a facilitator still be used in that classroom to help with the remote students? Uh, so the facilitators are not teachers, they don't teach. And so right now with the live teaching, the teacher literally works with students in the classroom and then turns and engages with the students online. Our, our um, facilitators are not certified teachers. Um, however, we did also note that if we go back to a full day schedule, which is what was would be needed, that we will not have the facilitators anymore. Um, again, everything we outlined tonight is, is what would happen if we are not able to make any other changes. We've been working on this since September. We're continuing to work on it. I'm hopeful we have other information, like we get a stimulus and I can hire a ton more staff, um, but that is not our current reality. So um, we, we would not have a facilitator in every classroom like we do now because the facilitators are paraprofessionals who would have to go back to their job. Um, they are um, special educators who would have to go back to their supervision. And they are people that we need to provide supervision for children because again, every almost every single educator has their preparation time in the afternoon when children are working independently if we add those two hours somebody needs to watch those children every educator can't have their preps then there is no time in the day every educator can have their prep when students are present it's just, it's just not enough people to watch the students so you have to stagger those preparation periods all through the day that means those facilitators that are in a classroom helping a teacher now, they have to be used to supervise classrooms when teachers are having their prep period or lunch or what have you. Melissa Shine, 71 Kilseth Road. I'm concerned because it very much feels as though Riley is forcing students back in just in time for MCAS. Parents are still able to opt their children out of MCAS. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, I will note in every year past that there is a measure that the state uses for the purpose of accountability. We do not know if they're going to use it this year. We have no idea, but it says that 90% of your students need to take MCAS. And if not, then you, um, your accountability level is reduced significantly. 
well, the other thing too is parents parents technically can't opt their child out because they they um, it is a law that every public school has to provide this assessment to every child. Um, so the parent would have to not. I mean, there's more. There's more. It's more complex. They can't just send in a note and say, "I opt my child out," and then the school doesn't provide the assessment. They actually the the school still has to provide the assessment, and the student just has to refuse not to take it. And has so that also puts, to take it, and then they have to be given an alternate assignment, and right. it takes and, staff to do that as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Andrea Brown, 149 Dean Street. What would be the half day kindergarten schedule? What would the half day kindergarten schedule be with a full in person return? Uh, it would probably be um, exactly like it was with a full in person return. So it would be half a day, five days a week. Melissa Shine, 41, uh, 71 Kilseth Road, just added thank you for all you do. Eve Reed, 1 Scotch Dam Road. I recently learned I recently learned there was a survey sent to parents of remote learners last month. Can you share the results of that survey? Also, can you confirm what percent of students are fully remote as of today? Um, the survey that was sent actually was articulated in our plan in August. We told everybody we were sending a survey in time for January and we're doing it again before April. The survey was to ask remote parents who wanted to come back in the January window. And we're gonna do the same thing in April. So um, we can share the data, but all that's gonna tell you is how many families that were remote chose to come back in January, uh, February, <laughs> and how many, um, no, in January, and the one in April is going to say how many are coming back in April. Um, so I'm not sure how you're looking to use that data, but if you can share how you're looking to use it, maybe we could give you better data for whatever you're looking for, um, because that just tells us uh, who's coming back. And I think we had a hundred and something students come back out of maybe 500. So um, I hope that's helpful, but I'm... And the, the, data, the data was used for our planning purposes to get the kids back in school. So we had to know exactly how many kids were coming back so we could make those arrangements in the classroom. Um, Pam Booth, 35 Vineyard Place. Will there be any change to the requirement of quarantining after returning from travel? If students return full-time and there's no remote learning, then every child that travels over April vacation will not receive any instruction for approximately two weeks. Is that true? Um, unless state regulations change, uh, that is true. And what I mean by that is the safe states in the country. Um, right now it's North Dakota, Hawaii, I think in Massachusetts, and that's all. Um, if someone's coming back from one of those states, they don't need to take a test. Otherwise, the requirements will not change. And yes, it's correct. They would have to quarantine. My concern, of course, is what I said earlier with parents potentially not disclosing travel because they don't want their students to miss school and effectively um, exponentially increasing the risk to students and staff in the buildings. And there is no way of us knowing that. Katie Williams, Lincoln Street, with all the talk of data, why are we not focusing on the data of the low, of the low to zero rates of transmissions in school? Um, actually, I think I've talked about that at every school committee meeting so far. Um, we are extremely proud of the fact that we have not had close contacts test positive in Easton. And we have said, and um, the Board of Health agrees with us, that we all believe it is because we have six foot social distancing. So we have talked about it. We are extremely proud of it. Um, I tell as many people as possible because we believe it is a direct result of what we have in place right now. Caroline. 
Uh, to that point, um, I, I don't have all of the details with me. I'm, I was in the process of studying it, but there was a new study in Georgia by the CDC of a large school district, I think something like 6,000 kids. Um, and uh, what they found is that there was actually quite significant in-school transmission uh, when they were able to test everybody on a regular basis, which this, this was part of a, you know, sort of a research study that was being done by the CDC. Um, unfortunately, uh, one thing they found is that most of the transmission was actually adult to adult, educator to educator or to, you know, other staff. But um, they also found that the primary um, reason for the in-school transmission was the failure to maintain six foot distance. Now, uh, again, this is a new study. It's just one state and it's, um, you know, it hasn't been analyzed by other uh, scientists at this point, but I don't think that we can just, I mean, I agree with Leisha that, that, you know, one of the reasons I think that our transmission has been very low, we've had very few outbreaks or infections is because we have had that that six foot distance. Obviously, we're going to um, obey the laws. And if there's a mandate to have full in person, we will accept that. In addition, I totally agree that it's much better for kids and families if we can have full in person. But you know, there is that virus out there. And there's just, you know, we have a lot of variants that are showing up, but a new one in New York City now looks very dangerous indeed. So I, I don't think it's as simple as to say that we just, that there's low to zero transmission in schools universally. I think that it's more complex than that. And that those schools where there is low transmission often are really paying close attention to protocols, including the, the six foot distancing. Not all, there are schools with three foot distancing that are showing very low rates of transmission and that's great. Um, some of that may be due to testing that's not really occurring. And um, there's lots of reasons why Easton hasn't been able to participate in, in uh, routine testing. But I think it's just more complicated than to say kids need to be in school and we just need to do it. We still have a very, very serious pandemic to, you know, that kind of clouds everything, makes everything so much more complicated. Noelle Hiltz, 111 Summer Street. If remote learning changes, will a decision be made on a grade by grade level based on whether an EPS teacher is willing to take on a new class of fully remote students, or will the decision be made for the district as a whole? Thank you. Um, the commissioner has said that we have to give a remote option for every grade level, and we will. Um, it's entirely dependent on how many students are at that grade level. Um, if there are 20 students, then that would be one class. If there are 45 students, then that would be two classes. So it, it totally depends on the grade level, but right now we have remote students in every grade level, so it would be um, every grade level. Uh, K through five, six to eight, that becomes impossible because uh, you can't have an English teacher, a science teacher, a math teacher, a history teacher for every single grade and every single level. We wouldn't have any staff left in the building. That's an entirely different sol uh, problem to solve. Erica Mandel, 50 Main Street. If remote is no longer going to be considered learning time in April, how can people still choose full remote? Uh, great question. We have asked that and we have not been provided with that answer. Kathleen Sheehan. Oh, her address was back there. Do it, should I go back and find it? That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Follow up question. If teachers are six feet, it would not be a change in working conditions. Again, why would this need to be negotiated? Um, so this is this is just a legal fact. I'm not giving you an opinion. If an employee is asked to work within a close contact range, you want to negotiate, well, you have to negotiate working conditions, but 
frankly, we want to negotiate working conditions. If the staff can think of anything that we can provide that will make them feel more comfortable or will make them safer, we want to provide it. We are, we are on the same team. We are a very strong and collaborative team. Um, I'm, I'm, again, I would just certainly, um, Ms. Sheehan, you did not say this, and I'm not saying you mean this in any way, but it is just reminding me of my advice earlier to, um, for people to not make determinations about what is happening um, based on state reports for any particular town. I understand that there is a lot of controversy with unions across the state, but we in Easton work very well together and we hope to continue to do that. Brian Mandeville, I apologize, I mispronounced your last name, 10th Road Drive. How can you say that anything will change for next year for children to get full access, to get access to full-time in-person learning? There's currently seven months to plan in order to avoid this again. And if things are the same pandemic-wise as Fauci is calling this an endemic now, are you saying you are just hoping it's better rather than actually making a plan to overcome existing circumstances? You can't hope it will be different. We need a plan. Um, no, sir. I'm saying that right now we are focusing every minute of every day on April 1st. Then we will focus every minute of every day on the rest of the school year. Then we will focus every minute of every day on the summer. And then we will focus every minute of every day in September. We do not have any data that says anything otherwise in September. And if you have a source that can tell us where COVID is going to be in September, I would encourage you to share that with us so that we can make a more informed decision. Kelly Jackson, Christopher Drive. I wanna say thank you for putting the health and safety of our children and staff first. I appreciate all the hard work that you have done. And contrary to many of the negative comments, many others share this appreciation. Thank you for your support. Lisa Maggot, 18 Julie Road. This is a follow-up to my question regarding our seniors. A lot of senior parents feel as though our senior children are being forgotten about. We've received no communication regarding any conversations that may or may not be taking place about how to celebrate them during a terrible senior year. Can you please tell me what, if anything, is being considered for them? Also, I've heard the last day of school for seniors is possibly being changed. Is this true? Uh, so last year, um, there were so many events and activities for our seniors to make them feel extremely special. Uh, and the same things are happening now. Um, there is a boat cruise, there is a senior parade, there are many activities. If your senior is not aware of those, uh, I would encourage you to contact the high school because there are a lot of things going on. Some that I would say create a better experience than any senior in history um, in terms of having long-term um, memorabilia and things that they can um, take as memories. I will tell you that I have been very, very, very impressed with our students. And um, the only thing I could, I, I can't recommend anything more than going back on ECAT and watching the senior commencement from last year and the student speeches about their ability to be resilient and that they feel um, very positive about their experience here. Um, we, do, we can't control the pandemic, but we certainly have provided a great deal to our seniors last year and are going to be this year. And if you aren't aware of the details, please contact the school uh, tomorrow and they will give you all the details that you're looking for. Yeah, and I will just add also, I've been in touch with uh, Mr. Paul and he is regularly communicating with the senior class about events and possibilities. And we're just waiting right now to see what the, possi what the possibilities are due to, as, as Dr. Cabral stated, due to what the governor has just, has just changed. 
I'll also just point out that the Lieutenant Governor just talked about dance floors. I don't know if anyone saw that at the press conference today, and she said dance floors will be allowed only at weddings. So I don't know what that's going to mean for, you know, for proms and things like that. So these are all announcements that are happening in real time and we're having to adapt. Um, so these are these are things that we're just constantly and you know, I know that Mr. Paul is working very closely with the seniors on this. Um, Maria Picanzi, Five Wedgwood Drive. Stop putting fear in people. We are all living in this pandemic that is showing significant decline. If you want kids in school, then make it happen. You are the manager of this business and you need to figure out the logistics now, all in capital letters. So um, I I'm not sure if you just joined us, Ms. Picanzi, but if you have, you may want to um, go back at your convenience and see this um, recording because we explained exactly what was going to be happening for students to come back to school. Lauren Loomis for Abbey Road, thank you for the presentation. I think it is it was fair and balanced and showed the reality of what life is and a picture of what what is to come. The comments that they are fear mongering is not fair. I appreciate you informing all of us of realis realistic expectations. This is complicated and none of this is a unique to a, a unique Easton issue. Um, Melissa Shine, oh gosh. I know that she asked a question before, but I have to go back and I'll come back That's, to that. that we, you, she did ask when you said her address, okay. so go ahead. Melissa Shine, what can we do as parents to advocate for EPS to get some kind of stimulus? Uh, contact your legislature, le legislators. Um, we do it regularly. Um, I would say the same for if you are interested in this um, for vaccinations for our educators, contact your legislators often. Um, other than that, we have no other control over what they decide to do. Tracy Debbie, 38 Gas Gaslight Lane. I have two OA students. Neither has had a facilitator all year, so I'm not understanding the logistic regarding losing facilitators. Most of these issues seem to be related to elementary school, so why not bring older kids back? So um, again, because of the requirement for K to five, we've been focusing on K to five this evening, but we have described some of the um, issues at the middle and high school. We just haven't discussed them as much tonight because we are focusing on K to five first because that's the mandate, but certainly you could, um, refer to prior meetings or um, send your question to us via email and we can try to answer that for uh, answer that for some of you. We've been working on middle school and elementary school, uh, excuse me, middle school and high school return as well since the beginning of the year. And um, we won't stop doing that. We've been doing that um, as well as the elementary students, but as you may have heard tonight, some of the impediments we feel actually um, go backwards a little bit. And so we weren't looking to do that. Um, some different considerations um, work the same way for middle and high school, but we are continuing to still work on it and we will until we find um, a solution that we feel is better for kids than what's happening right now. Kristen Hobbs, 18 Lyman Wheelock. I apologize if this was addressed earlier, but with regard to the rally, of the union due to the April back to school requirement, will we be looking at a teacher strike with a full shutdown? Uh, so teacher strikes are illegal in Massachusetts. Um, and again, I would just encourage people to remember that um, what happens in one town or city or even with a state organization is not necessarily what's reflective in a particular town. We have a very cooperative um, union that is dedicated to your kids. We would not have gotten to the point we have so far or have the exemplary program that is being modeled by so many others if it weren't the case. And it's a direct result of their work. So um, I can't control what anyone decides to do, but um, 
like I said, we try to work cooperatively and collaboratively so that everyone is as satisfied as they can be under the conditions. Ginger LeMay, address previously stated. You are wonderful, by the way, a million thank yous. Samantha Hill, 22 Whittier Lane. Thank you to all teachers, parents, committee, board members, and administrators who have been working so hard all school year and continue to do so. My children are in, co in cohort A, are reaping the benefits of so many dedicated people's work during the pandemic. Thank you. Erica Mandel, 50 Main Street. In regards to a previous comment, I know myself and several others here try, and be, try to be and are very respectful. Asking questions and advocating for our children does not mean we support you any less. We are literally begging to help in any way we can. Just had to add that. We are not bad people. We are fighting for what we feel is right for our children. Thank you. Um, I completely agree. As I've said before, we are what I consider to be a very collaborative and cooperative um, school department, and that includes parents. We've had great cooperation from our parents. I know everyone's fighting for children, but I can't possibly assure you anymore that we are fighting for your children just as hard. Um, and the only reason we haven't brought them back to this point is because, as I said, with the input of our professionals and our own experience, education, and observations of your children, some of these have the potential to set our kids back a little bit and we didn't want to do anything that did that. With that said, we're never going to stop giving 100% to you, to your kids. We are encouraging your comments. We are encouraging your feedback um, and we want to keep working together. That's the only way we can get anything done for our kids. And the last question, Lauren Romero, Benson Circle. Can you provide on the website the names and contact info for our legislatures so us as parents can contact for stimulus and teacher va vaccinations? Thank you. Um, that if you want to Google Massachusetts legislators or Massachusetts Senate uh, or um, Easton senators, Easton representatives, um, you can get that information. That's something that I think um, would be very, um, appropriate for someone, a parent, for example, to perhaps post on social media, if that's helpful for you to get that information. Jennifer? I just, I also want to add that uh, at the represent, at the state representative and state senate level, it varies by district who your representatives are. So it's not necessarily the same people for everybody in Easton. So there are a lot of websites where you can just type in your address um, and it will tell you um, who your who your representatives are, depending on your district. Great point. We do have one last question, actually, that just came in. So if we want to include this, Todd Kerensky, 14 Apple Blossom Lane. Thank you for all that you do to keep students, educators, staff, and the community safe while educating our future. When would families know if schools will be open for in-person education in fall 2021? Our current plan is for schools to be open normally in fall of 2021 when our medical professionals and our government tell us that is not okay is when we will change it. And we just don't have that information right now. Um, but right now we're coming back based on the information we do have that says we should, we will be fine by then to have in-person instruction. Um, but we don't, we don't control um, state and federal mandate. So once we find out, are people able to be vaccinated at the, what the state projects the numbers to be, which is late summer? Um, what happens with the numbers? What happens with COVID? What ha we won't know until the government tells us, unfortunately. And you will have that information probably simultaneously because it's um, in the press frequently, of course. Okay, and I also have a couple of emails that I received for questions. Allison Daly, 32 Deborah Lee Lane. In regards to the recurrent issue of space, I also second the idea to finding alternative space options. 
Many towns utilize tents and have for a number of months. Harvard, Massachusetts is one such town. I do think this is possible. Alternatively, private spa space is available at Maplewood and the Easton YMCA. This space has been rented collectively by Easton families for remote facilitation. This is a great benefit to families, but it is also a financial burden on those families. Did Easton look into renting these facilities when tents were deemed unsafe? I do believe Easton families could rally around transportation to have the opportunity to attend five days if that were an issue. Thank you. Um, so we talked about tents previously. Um, that's gonna be different town to town. So I'm sure people have used them, but we tried to and we weren't given permission. We cannot do that without permission. Um, in terms of private spaces, uh, we need to remember that you cannot just send um, a class and a teacher to a private space for a few reasons. First of all, we need those teachers throughout the school day to provide supervision throughout the school at other periods during the day. Um, secondly, we have to provide lunch to students and we don't have a way of, of doing that if they're not in school. Um, third, we have so many federal safety, insurance, OSHA requirements that we, I mean, this is all the behind the scenes stuff that we work on every day. Um, while a private company can certainly, or a private um, community member can certainly rent out space, schools cannot do that. We have a great deal of laws that we have to follow um, in terms of fire codes, size of rooms, flammable materials in the buildings. Uh, we have control over all of those things and have regular inspections of all of that. We do not have the resources to make facilities changes or provide that um, at private sites. And we don't have anybody to do the, the inspections. Um, you have to have a certain amount of fire suppression materials and certain size toilets for kids who are a certain age. We are just not held to the same standard as uh, private um, citizens. And well, fortunately, because it's for the safety of our children, but unfortunately in this situation, because it just makes things like that impossible. Sounds like it makes sense but um, most people are not aware of all of the regulations that we have to follow on a daily basis. Okay, and another one, Patricia Stokes, Five Meeting House Lane. Thank you, Dr. Cabral and the school committee for putting the safety of our kids, teachers and community at the forefront of your planning. The logistics are clearly extremely complicated and I feel very confident that you are thinking about all the variables and making sure that our plan is realistic. This is a no win for anyone. And I thank you all for the deep consideration that you are putting into every decision. Thank you, Patricia. And then another one, um, Eva Reed, I don't have her address, but- um, I think she asked a question previously, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. But she was looking at um, cohort A and cohort B with conferences and stuff and, how, you know, Monday holidays, so just the difference in the days, five days for cohort A and eight and a half days for cohort B missing school. So, you know, maybe like looking at the calendar for this, I don't know, for the spring or whatever, she didn't really say, but. Go ahead, Mrs. Pro. Yeah, I sorry. actually, I actually just but, looked at that. I'm sorry. Oh, you got it too? Yeah. I, yeah, well, no, I actually just looked at that data today and um, it's one day off. So cohort B actually comes to school one day less okay. than cohort A. So if we were to switch the date, then cohort A would be one day less. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just not equal because it's just not going to work out that way. And by okay. the way, when we do that count, we do it for the entire year. So if right. someone's done it to this point right now, it may be off, but it gets made up later on in the school year. Okay, thank you. And the other, uh, one other one, Wendy Cross, Hollow Street. Um, there has been no communication to seniors about any activities. So that was about um, the 
of thing. Okay. I've been copied on some of them, so I know that they've gone out. Um, definitely parents should contact the school. Perhaps there's something wrong with the email. I'm not sure, but I have gotten them myself. Um, and it isn't just to me. I can see that I'm attached. So again, I would just um, encourage people to contact the school. They want you to have the information, and I'm sure they would be happy to provide it. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Any more, Chrissy? Okay. Okay, and thank you everyone for your questions and thoughtfulness. All right, um, up next, superintendent notes. Uh, as of right now, I don't have anything. I'm sure I'll think of something. <laughs> One of you usually reminds me of something. Um, assistant superintendent notes. I just want to update the committee on where we stand with the process for the new high school principal at Oliver Ames. Um, we are currently, we've currently completed round one of interviews and we will be notifying candidates for their move on to the second round. Um, we had, it, it's actually a four step process. So once they completed the first round, they, um, we, are now, we interviewed 10 candidates. We had 31 applicants, we interviewed 10 candidates. We narrowed that down and then the, the next candidates will be doing a, another interview, a, a deeper interview um, where we get more in depth with some of the questions and some of the content. We are actually doing those in person and we will be notifying those candidates um, within the next couple of days to set up those interviews and those will be next week. After that, we will be looking at um, those that those interviews and potentially narrowing it down for site visits and um, site visits to their districts, as well as having the candidates come to Oliver Ames and Easton. Um, so that's and then finally, we'll be re recommending um, a couple for a final interview with Dr. Cabral. So that's the process um, again, just to notify the community and the committee that we are hoping to have this process completed in the next principal of Oliver Ames High School named around April 9th. And that's it? And that's all I have for you tonight. Okay. It's late. School committee, <laughs> uh, school committee notes, Caroline. Uh, well, I, I know that uh, we've kind of all agreed that no one considers the educational model that we are currently using to be the best for children, but um, I wish I could remember where I saw this. It was an educational foundation, but there was um, a wonderful article about how much kids have gained in the area of uh, facility with technology and how much that's going to benefit them in the future. So as difficult as everything has been, there is that there are a couple of bright spots here and there. And, and I think that is one of them that, you know, kids are doing things that no one could imagine uh, even a year ago. And some of them are, you know, five years old. So I, I think that is just a little bit of a bright spot in all of this bleakness that we've had to deal with. Thank you, Caroline. How's that? Michelle. I actually have a question. Um, so I've been contacted by a, um, a number of parents um, about a drama club. And I'm wondering why they wanted to have uh, some type of monologue performance, live streamed or pre recorded, kind of as a culminating event. But I think that that wasn't allowed. And I'm just, I'm curious as to why, because we do have our sport events so that are inside. We have our music things going on inside. Um, are you talking about the high school? Yeah. I don't know. That's they not have something to, you're aware of? Those parents would need to contact the high school to ask that question. I will say that there was a performance. It wasn't a live stream because we actually, um, we actually encouraged them to record what they were doing, um, that what I'm aware of is was a request to do a performance. We contacted the Board of Health and the Board of Health um, quoted the current guidance that said that you couldn't have more, I believe it was 10 people, you couldn't have more than uh, whatever the amount of people was. 
um, we passed on that information. It was more, um, it was less people than they were going to have. So that's just a Massachusetts mandate. We don't have control over that. Um, Massachusetts has performances listed separately. I don't know why they're doing it, but we listed can't. separately than sports. Is that what you're saying? Um, inside activities different than outside activities, and um, if, if it involves singing, it's different. And every activity is listed separately. Um, we thought we understood the guidance and shared it, but we checked with the Board of Health to be sure, uh, and they confirmed that they couldn't do it. Um, I, I've never heard about a recording not being allowed. Um, I would say they need to contact the school because contacting you or I is not helpful because we don't deal with that regularly. They would have to contact the school and they would be happy to answer their questions, I'm sure. So then, so but there is a possibility maybe of doing it outside or if it's one or two kids doing a monologue or something that's recorded, I guess I'm not seeing how that's. That's not what I was asked. I was asked about a performance. So okay. what I'm saying so is revisiting the details. No, what I'm saying is you, you should ask that person to contact the high school so they can answer that question. That is not something that was brought to me and I have no knowledge of it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, One thing that's important to remember is that the sports are governed by, governed by MIAA. They provide guidelines. There are many other activities that don't have an organization that do that. It's unfortunate, but that is not, that has nothing to do with the school department, unfortunately. But isn't like the, the bands playing inside now? I mean, they have their protective equipment on instruments and stuff, but they're performing and practicing, and I believe what singing can now start happening. Uh, not yet. Right. I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding how this could not have been worked out, but. Well, you're, I don't know that it couldn't be worked out. I don't know anything about it, is what I'm saying. I, they need to contact the high school. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Jackie? Nothing tonight. Okay, thank you. Jen? No, nothing tonight. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I just have one thing. Um, congratulations to Claire Cronin, um, who just became House Majority Leader. So congratulations to Claire, we're very proud of you. Um, and wish you all the luck in the world. Um, Okay, our next meeting is March 11th at five o'clock on Zoom. And I'm gonna make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Do I have a second? Sure, yeah. second. second. <laughs> <laughs> now you have, three, you have three seconds. <laughs> when they all seconded, every single one of them. Okay. We have to unmute uh, first. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all those in favor of adjourning. O'Neill, yes. Durance, yes. DeLuca, yes. Wiseman, yes. Star, yes. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.